Hello, and welcome to session two of Brain First Parenting. If you have not yet watched session one, I would highly encourage you to start there so that the content in session two makes sense. In session two, Eileen will be discussing secondary characteristics and how to understand your child's challenging behaviors as symptoms of their brain-based differences. All right, I wanna welcome you all back for our second session of three um, for the Brain First Parenting program. Um, we covered a lot of material last time. And so I wanted to begin by checking in with all of you to see if there were questions that came up specific to the information that we covered last week um, or any reflections on how it came up for you this week in your parenting. Um, oftentimes when we have a little bit of time to let that information settle, then we have more clarity in terms of questions or it's like, oh, I thought I understood that, but I actually didn't. Um, so I wanna take a moment to just see how everyone's doing, answer any questions, um, and then we'll do a little review of last week too, just to be sure that we're all kind of starting from the same place this week. Eileen, I can, sh oh, okay. go ahead. I was gonna say, I can share something. Um, so my daughter had a very tough night, the one night, and she's gone into this new routine of going to bed, but she doesn't really want to. So she does all these stall tactics, whatever we're on to her and she'll lay down and then she gets up and then she creeps out of her room and you know, whatever. And we do all these things to put her back into bed. So the one night she does this and my boyfriend who lives with us, um, she, he's, you know, talking to her and saying, go back to bed. Well, she starts screaming at him, like screaming. And she's like, no. And I, I mean, I don't even know what comes out of her mouth. I can't even remember. She might've even said like, don't hurt me, which we've never heard her. Like, I don't even know why she says that, but she'll just say, don't hurt me. And, and I don't want to, and you're stupid and all these things. And he screamed back at her. Like he got loud at her too. And then she legitimately, now she's 14 and she's definitely a, a teenager. And she just smacked him right across the face. And I was wow. like, oh my God. Like, and I don't even know where she sees this stuff because it's not like we've ever done that to her. Like, whatever. I mean, I guess TV, but so then he just like screams and he's like, get back to your room. Like, you don't do that. And, and then, you know, she went back to her room. I went in there and I said, you know, that's not being kind. And, you know, we do all those things and tell her like, that's not how you act and, and whatever. And she cried herself to sleep and whatever. Now the next day, you know, we always bring it up again and we talk about it and we tell her that it's not good or you know, not kind. And that's not, and she'll say, but I love him. And I'm like, but that's not how you show love. Now, as I'm talking to her the next day, I heard you <laughs> and you were like, <laughs> what if, and I'm like sitting there and I'm like, what if what? And I'm like trying to find the what if in this situation. And for the life of me, I'm sorry, Eileen, I could not, I couldn't figure it out. I'm like, what if, what? I'm like, she understands. She was sitting there list, listing all of the things. Like, you know, I was thinking back to you saying, um, like your daughter, like you can only give her like the two commands, anything over that, like she can't do. And yes. you know, a lot of that applies to Lena as well, but she's sitting there talking back to me, like saying, don't hit. Uh, I love him, um, yes. you know, and I'm like, she's telling me everything she shouldn't be doing. Like, yes. I'm like, what if what? <laughs> yeah. Well, so Jenny, I love that you in this really terrible situation that would get the, like, we would all, I would imagine we would all have visceral reactions to what you described, like the, a 14 year old still needing to be put to bed and getting up and going back and getting up and going back, like that should not happen at that age, right? I mean, that's kind of our, that's kind of our behavioral lens that can really get the best of us in those moments because we are human. And then on top of that, how aggressive she was and hitting and all of that kind of stuff, right? So um, I think it's amazing 
that even, even if it was the next day and not in that moment, right, it's a learning curve, that you were able to take that step back and just say, what if? What if there's something else going on? That is a huge step. And that's the first step. And it's hard. And it's something we practice for the rest of our lives as we parent our children, right? So you should feel really good about that. Um, the what if connecting it to lagging skills and brain function, that is the learning curve. And wonderful if you can already make those connections. Um, you, you sound like you're in exactly the right place based on the information you've learned so far. <laughs> right? <Okay. laughs> so, so the next piece of that would be to outside of the moment when you're not in her presence, when you have a spare moment, I know they're hard to come by, but we have to carve it out to do this because this is how we rise that steep learning curve is to look and say, okay, this is the chain of events that happened. Where did I first begin to notice kind of the unsettledness or I don't even know if that's a word, but you, don't, you all know what I'm talking about, um, kind of the amping up and how can I connect that situation and what was going on there to the way, to her lagging skills? Then we get out the screening tool. We say, well, what are her lagging skills? I can't even remember. Well, that's where the screening tool helps us. And we go through and say like, oh, okay, this is what might have been going on. Like that transition to bed, what's that about? Where can accommodations and more support happen there? Her inability to tolerate you know, being in trouble, strong emotion, frustration, whatever, right? I mean, that's what it sounds like you're describing in terms of the interactions with your boyfriend and with you and that kind of thing. And so if we understand that she's going to flip her lid like she did very, very quickly, despite being 14, despite being this a very easy thing that she should be able to do at 14, then how do we respond and keep our regulation intact to help her ease into that transition? The next day, having a conversation Remember I was talking about they can talk the talk but can't walk the walk, but that's super common lagging skill, right? I think it's under learning and memory on the screening tool. And so looking and saying like, okay, does she really get it? Does she really get it? Is she really connecting these dots? And if it doesn't seem like it because she's saying this over and over again, but that it never translates to behavior, how can I help her make those, connect those dots? Does that help? Yeah, and I guess that makes sense because... Like I always say, like, it's so hard because, you know, anytime I've brought her to like, you know, a neuropsychologist or, you know, you're talking in IEP meetings or even, you know, just discussing with my boyfriend, it's like, it's hard because it's that gray area because it's like, you see, you feel like she understands, but at what level does she understand? Because it's like, she'll repeat all of these things. But mm -hmm. to me, it's like a loop. Like she associates getting in trouble. Like she'll bring up, if I yell at her for something, she'll be like hands to self. Mm -hmm. And like, maybe she wasn't, maybe that time it wasn't even her hitting somebody, you know, mm -hmm. like she'll just, she just takes all of those associations and just blurts them all out. So it's like yeah. all of those things. Yeah. And that's where I'm like, it's that gray area. Cause it's like, you feel like she understands because she knows she's in trouble. She's repeating back all of the things yes. that you've told to her for the last seven years that she shouldn't be doing. But yes. at the same time, she's bringing up things that don't apply to that situation. So it's yeah. like she's stuck in that loop. Well, and she's showing you, she doesn't understand. I mean, that's the, that's the hard thing is, well, so here's my experience has been in my own parenting and working with other parents is that as you continue to deepen your understanding of your child through this lens, that you start to recognize just how much they miss, just how lagging behind they are in certain skills. And so I want you all to prepare yourselves for that. That is the, that is what needs to happen. It's like, once you start to see it, you can't unsee it and you go deeper and deeper and deeper. You become more and more familiar with like, oh, wow, wow. Like, this is what I assumed they could do. And they can't even do that. Like I see it now, right. And all the observations that you're describing, Jenny. And with that comes a whole lot of grief and like, oh my gosh, like I knew that she had lagging skills, but man, now I really see just how far behind. And so 
working through that grief. We're going to talk about that next week. <laughs> it's not a fun topic necessarily, but it's a necessary one. Um, working through that is so essential because we have to come out of the other side of that to be able to then move on and develop accommodations um, in the way that they require, right? To see them settle more and more and more and more. So thank you for sharing that. That's a wonderful example of linking all this information together. Oh, I'll say really quickly too, the other thing that we'll talk about next week is, I mentioned it a little bit last week, is the idea of regulation, our child's fragile nervous system, how well or not well they regulate, how well or not well we regulate, the co-regulation that happens or doesn't <laughs> based on that dynamic and why that's so essential, right? So thinking about that situation of like upping the ante where we just kind of spin out with our child why, why are be remaining regulated as our greatest parenting tool in those moments, right? And how exactly we do that, build it over time. So, all right. Other questions or observations that folks wanted to share? I'll piggyback off Jenny. It's same thing with Isaiah. You know, we'll be like, at school, they use this mantra and we do it at home, safe hands, safe body. So all I have to say is safe and he'll repeat it. Or, you know, if he's doing something he shouldn't, we'll ask him and he can go through his file of things he's no, he knows he's supposed to say, but he's just saying it. He's not getting it. Um, so the other day we're sitting on the couch and I was, I mentioned uh, last weekend, he's constantly hitting. And I know it's not to be mean or hurt anyone. It's just like, he's, I've always known it's like a check-in for him. So I grabbed his hand. We we're sitting on the couch. I grabbed his hand and I was just doing some deep pressure, which I've done before, but he sat there for a good five minutes, just letting me do it. So that was a step because instead of getting mad saying, stop hitting me, stop hitting me. I just didn't say anything. I grabbed his hand and, mm. you know, until he pulled it away. But for a good five, 10 minutes, maybe he let me do that. And there's five, That's 10 great. minutes. I wasn't getting hit. So. Yeah. So looking at it through this lens and you talk about, you know, that it's not about him hitting you. It's not about aggression. It's about checking in. Can you link that to his brain function? Like what is it about his brain working differently where he needs that check-in? Yeah, I don't know. So I would, I would be curious about sensory seeking kind of the sensory pieces, feeling grounded in his space. I don't know if you remember last week, um, me talking about the kid who runs to get in line and he doesn't know That's that right he's there. in line till he hits the kids next to him. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 He, it's literally feeling like disoriented in their body, not being, not feeling grounded in their environment and their space, unless they are literally attached to something. That's why we say these kids, they don't just hang on you. They fuse themselves to you. Many of them do. Um, Cause they need that a lot of the time. Yeah. So, you know, seeing that, like you had it, you knew it wasn't about misbehavior, him being like, you know, like I said, just wanting to be mean, it was about something else, but even taking it a step further and saying, well, what is that helps yes. us deepen our understanding, which helps our reactivity. So you did an amazing job of not, you know, yelling, what are you doing? Whatever, you know, whatever many of us would do. <laughs> In that I situation. still do that's it, fun. but in that moment. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, that's like you're human, just yeah. like all of us. <laughs> but you're right with the sensory seeking, but there's, I feel like there's only so much of that I can give them. Like um, jumping on the couch, fine. You know, I don't care if he jumps on the couch because it's, you got to pick your battles, right? And if that's helping him feel grounded, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway. Right. Right. It's when other so, people are around. That's why do you let him jump on the couch? You know, stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, and it's hard when you feel the full rate of weight of that responsibility. I mean, that's what I hear you saying is there's only so much I can give him of that. And right. so part of the accommodations process is how can I relieve myself of some of the accommodations? <laughs> like set things up where people around me or I can set things up for him where it's not always on me. Right. And I know that's hard. Um, those answers aren't always readily available to us, but I think we can get there sometimes um, without, without necessarily thinking that in the beginning. So 
Great. Any other questions or thoughts before we review a little bit? I just uh, got a question in my head because you said, um, you know, that, that um, groundness and the latching on. And another thing that I just noticed is that like, so as many of the other kids, you know, they're off of school right now. And like, she needs to be by me all day. Right. And and she's an only child. Like I get it. And it's, you know, not a big deal, but at the same time, like she gets mad if I'm trying to help her. Hmm. Like, so it's like, she's aggravated because I'm right there, but yet like, she won't give me space. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. So hold on to, so I hope everybody can hold on to that comment and I'll make sure to bring it up again when we talk about co-regulation because we all need to have co-regulation from those around us. And we can either be a buffer influence um, or a triggering influence to all of those around us, not just our kids. So that's kind of a lot, feels like a lot of pressure, right? Because it's not something that we have full control over. It happens at a physiological level. So it's not a mental process, but there's a lot that we can do mentally to help our physiological state, (laughs) okay? When our kids have really fragile nervous systems, like every single one of your children do, based on their diagnosis and what has happening to them medically, we can assume that they, at this biological, physiological level, seek co-regulation in larger doses than a typical child. And to get that, they need to be in our presence, right? It's, I mean, the science behind it is so, I'm like getting goosebumps. <laughs> Because it's so fascinating. It's so fascinating, right? And it sounds, when you first hear about it, it's like, whoa, that's kind of woo-woo. Like, really? But the science behind it is there. It's solid. It is, it, it's a part of the human experience. It just looks different for our kids. So that would be one of the things that I would wonder about, right? With her, Jenny. And I'm guessing other people have that experience too. All right. There was one more comment. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. So Amy, you were saying about the sensory piece and I did find some luck in in accommodations for that because I think that's one of Sophia's primary issues is sensory stuff. Um, But, and I'm amazed at how well it works. So for instance, um, I was watering the grass and she says, oh, can I get soaking wet? And she said, no. And normally that would turn into a huge meltdown. So I said, well, what if I just spray your hands with the hose? And she's like, sure. And so I get her hands wet and she's loving it. And then I was like, oh, let me get your feet wet. And I got her feet wet. She was happy and moved on. It was like a miracle in action because normally that would turn into a 45 minute meltdown. So it's like the accommodation is just giving her a little bit of that sensory seeking that she needed and she was good and she could move on. And the same thing mm-hmm. happened like with my Yassi. She kept wanting to take my turn. And I said, well, here, you can roll them into the box, but then I'm going to take them and it's going to be my turn. And she was totally okay with that. And I was amazed. I'm sorry. That's can awesome. you hear me okay? Uh-huh. Yeah. We can okay, good. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great example. And what I also like about it is that it shows your flexibility in that moment too, right? Oftentimes our first answer, because we feel like it might spiral out of control, or especially when we feel like it might lead to 45 minutes later, right? We say, no, <laughs> we're not going to even start this, right? But you were flexible and helped meet that need, right? That she has. So that's great. Yes. That and then I like I guess I kind of got stuck with in evaluating moment. Like I would find one um, characteristic and think it would be that that I needed to make the accommodation for, not realizing that there could be three or four different characteristics applicable to each situation. And if yes. one accommodation doesn't work for that characteristic, I could move on and try. Okay, well maybe it wasn't sensory seeking, maybe an accommodation for the executive function or the abstract mm-hmm. thinking would work. And so that really opened up a whole level of different accommodations that have helped. Yes, I love it. So we're going to get deep into accommodations today, and we will talk all about that, just exactly what you've described. 
So wonderful. Okay, so let's do a little bit of a review from last week, just to refresh our memories about where we are <laughs> in this model and this parenting paradigm and where we're gonna go today. So last week we talked about the foundational underpinnings or the foundational understanding of this model, which is that our child, our children have brains that are different in function and structure. The cause may be different, but um, the result, the impact on the brain is the same. The brain is a physical part of our body. So if our child's brain has been changed in function and structure, then they have a physical disability. Anyone with a physical disability deserves accommodations and our kids with brain differences are no different. The tricky piece is that that's often invisible, right? Behaviors are the symptoms. So it's invisible, we forget. <laughs> and um, certainly other adults who are in charge of their environments forget. So that's where the work is, is to figure out, to remind ourselves of that, take a step back and remind ourselves of that in the moment, but also do the work outside of the moment to develop accommodations, reflect, observe. We're gonna talk all about that today. So um, we look at behaviors being linked to brain function, the, the two can never ever be separated. And we divide brain or we divide the behaviors into two categories, primary characteristics, which we spent all last time talking about, and secondary characteristics. We're going to talk about those today. So those primary characteristics are um, behaviors that reflect how our child's brain works differently. So lagging skills, lagging cognitive skills, brain tasks that are difficult for them, those are all different ways to talk about it but they are behaviors that are our best insight into how our child's brain works differently. So hopefully you all were able to complete at least the first part of the screening tool that um, talks about primary characteristics where you now can see where the fours and the fives are. And what we, the, the work is to really focus on the fours and the five. I know that for many of you, there's probably a lot of them. We'll talk about how to make that more manageable today, um, but to not concern ourselves so much with the twos and the threes, ones, twos, and threes. Okay. It doesn't mean that we don't give those any attention at any point, but right now we want to focus on the fours and the fives. And the reason for that is that nine times out of 10, when our child has a challenging episode, challenging for them, challenging for those around them, it's going to be linked back to those fours and fives that you've circled on the screening tool, okay? There are always patterns. None of this is ever random out of the blue. I understand intimately how it can feel like I have no idea why they melted down like that. I have no idea where that aggression came from. But that's why we need to do the reflection and observation outside of the challenging moments so that we can start to see the patterns through this lens that you're learning, right? Through this, 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 um, these components that you're learning about, okay? Any questions about content that we covered last week? That was a very quick review, um, but I wanna make sure that that's clear. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen then. So today we are going to move into secondary characteristics. So we worked on primary characteristics last time. Secondary characteristics are the second way to sort of organize our understanding of the behaviors that we are seeing. Uh, my guess is many of you are familiar with Dr. Ross Green. He is a psychologist, if you're not, he's a psychologist who wrote, uh, he's written several books, but the one that parents are usually most familiar with is The Explosive Child. And it's an excellent book. He developed what's called collaborative problem solving, which I'm guessing many of you have heard of. And his model with collaborative problem solving and the neurobehavioral model that we're talking about here line up um, almost perfectly. There's a few points of divergence, but um, his work is excellent if you're ever looking for additional information on lagging skills, this brain-based approach. Um, he has a nonprofit called Lives in the Balance, 
and they have um, a wonderful website with lots of resources. They do lots of trainings, online trainings. Um, so I'd encourage you to check that out if you're interested in learning more. So he has this quote, children exhibit challenging behavior when the demands being placed upon them outstrip the skills they have to respond adaptively to those demands. The same can be said of all human beings. So we talked a little bit about this last week in that everything we're talking about with brain function, lagging skills, secondary behaviors is not unique to our children. It is the human experience. What's unique about our kids is that their brain works so differently that they have these lagging skills that get in their way all day long. Situations where people say, oh, they're 12, of course they can do this but they have such significant lagging skills, they can't possibly do it. And when that happens all day long, over and over and over again, in every environment that they encounter, then they're going to have challenging behaviors. <laughs> they're going to have a lot of secondary behaviors, right? So for us, if we are in a situation where someone insists that we do something that we do not have the skills to do, and we try to convince them of that, we try to plea with them, <laughs> Maybe we throw a fit. That's a secondary behavior, right? Saying, I don't know how to do it. And they insist that we're being lazy, selfish. We just don't care. We're not grateful, whatever it might be. We're going to have secondary behaviors, right? We're going to get angry. We're going to, um, maybe we'll get tearful, anxious, depressed, right? It just doesn't happen all that often with most of us because we are in that what society considers neurotypical kind of range of brain function. Okay. So Dr. Ross Green, he's um, also who captioned the phrase that I steal all the time. Kids would do well if they could, right? That it's about skill, not will. So why we see these challenging secondary behaviors, they are the symptoms, right? So when we have a child who has lagging cognitive skills, those primary characteristics, due to their brain-based differences. And then they are in an environment where expectations do not recognize those differences and there are no accommodations made, no adjusting of those expectations, then there's a poor fit and we will see challenging behaviors. So these are just a few common secondary behaviors. Um, if you went ahead and completed the rest of the screening tool, you will see that there are many more on there than this. Again, it's a scale of zero to five to help you start to make sense of the secondary behaviors versus those primary characteristics. One of the things that I would um, just, that I wanna just note is that um, the kids who experience those very outward secondary behaviors where they are aggressive, um, they run away, they um, really disrupt the environment that they're in, those we don't miss <laughs> because they are, um, they're very challenging, they're, you know, quote unquote, in our face, um, they're not hard to miss. There are a lot of kids who have secondary behaviors that are not disruptive in that way. So becoming more isolated, the fatigue, depression, um, you know, going inward in those sorts of ways. And the way that I think about that is that that is an internal meltdown, just as distressing to our child as those external meltdowns. So if that is your child, if you notice that happening more often than not, just to be aware of that, right? Um, to be um, on alert, I guess I would say for that. One of the very common secondary behaviors that we see in our kids is brain fatigue. And when we see a child who has brain fatigue, we're going to see challenging behaviors or those secondary behaviors. So I wanted to talk about this. I think we talked a little bit about it last time, but I wanna go into a little more detail um, because it's really important for us to understand. Um, and there was a mentioning of like, oh my gosh, 
here's this challenging situation. I think it was Nicole saying there, here's this challenging situation. And um, now I realize there are so many cognitive tasks involved. <laughs> I thought it was just this, but then I thought, oh my gosh, maybe it's executive functioning or this or that. Yes, right? Seemingly easy tasks that are very complex that we just don't recognize until we start to look at it through this lens. So every single small cognitive task that is required of our child throughout their day robs them of brain fuel, okay? Same with us. We all, if we slept well, which I know is a big if for all of you and for your kids. So just knowing that a poor night's sleep is going to diminish this tank even more, right? So let's assume though that we had a good night's sleep and we have that full tank of brain fuel. And every cognitive task, like wake up, get dressed, what do we need to do for the day, get breakfast ready, whatever it might be. Every single one of those seemingly easy automatic tasks takes some of our brain fuel. And if we are what society considers neurotypical, we will end the day hopefully with a little in the tank. We don't, so we're not losing it before we go to bed, right? Um, and we go to sleep and it replenishes and that's how we begin our day again. What happens with our kids is that because they are working so, so hard to navigate their day, and because these seemingly easy cognitive tasks are so difficult for them, that they, their, their tank gets close to empty really, really quickly, right? Um, and so we see that empty tank through challenging secondary behaviors. So a child who goes to school in the morning, does well for the first half of the day, but loses it the second half of the day. They probably have an empty tank. But what was required of them in the morning, sit still, listen, play nicely, rob them of all their fuel. Or a child who maybe makes it through the whole day, but comes home and loses it, explodes at home, right? So when we think about accommodations and we know that this happens with our child or we suspect that it does, we think, well, how can I help preserve their brain fuel, right? That's really where the accommodation lies. So things like if your child does well in school, but loses it at home, you know, even in the car, the minute they walk through the door, talking to your child's teacher and saying, I know he's doing really well in class and I'm so happy about that. And I'm so proud of him for that, but I need you to understand that it's a really, really taxing day for him because of these reasons. And you can use the screening tool to help them understand. He, it takes a lot out of him to sit still and listen. It takes a lot out of him to transition from this to this to this. It takes a lot out of him to be a good friend, right? Um, just to navigate his day, know what's coming next, anticipate. I mean, all of those tasks that kids are required to do in school. If they can get on board with that and know that even though they're not seeing the secondary behaviors you're seeing, that they need to accommodate anyways to help him preserve some of that brain fuel so that he can actually make it through the evening as well, then that is, that's huge, right? So that of course takes a lot of discussion. Um, it takes some persistence, <laughs> patient persistence. But man, if you can get there, your child is going to be doing so much better. The other thing that I think about when I think about the cognitive load and brain fuel and brain fatigue is when we have something that we are anticipating, say, in a really exciting day that our child is excited about and they're looking forward to, and it's always fun for them. Wonderful. But what do you see after that day has passed? Many times we see really, really challenging behaviors, right? And through a behavior lens, it can be, we just did this fun thing. Why are you being such a jerk, right? Why aren't you grateful? Like we just spent a whole day doing exactly what you want to do. <laughs> and this is how you treat me, right? What if that fun, exciting day took all the brain fuel he had and more and now the accommodation, you know this ahead of time because you've seen the pattern and you know how this has worked. You know that the next day, it needs to be nothing. It needs to be whatever it is that he can do to rest, to reset and re 
you know, fuel his brain. So, you know, you're not going to do that the day before school day because school would not happen or wouldn't go over well, right? Um, expectations that you have about chores or homework or whatever it might be. Mm -mm. Nope, not the day after something like that. And it's not letting him get away with something. It's knowing that his brain works differently in this way and he has to have time to recover, right? The, the same can be said for accommodations the day before too. If you anticipate this really taxing day from a cognitive standpoint, um, making sure that there's lots of rest and fuel up time the day before too, right? So that they can go into it um, with the fullest tank possible, okay? Any questions about that? It's a really important concept for us to understand for our kiddos. I don't have a question as much as I just want to say thank you um, for saying that. I'm going to cry on the recording. Um, that was really liberating what you just said about um, letting the school know. Mm -hmm. um, because I've spent like years really being miserable because all of the good attending and behavior and attitude, fun, energy, all of it has been given to school. Yeah. And everybody else. Yeah. And I am I get the worst. I get the bookends, the beginning and the end of the day. And so anyway, I'm sorry. I just that was yeah. really powerful for me. Yeah. And school starts Monday. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm glad that it was helpful and resonated with you. Um, and you know, Hillary, it is, it is such a huge strength of your daughters that she can perform like that <laughs> and hold it together in those situations. Like that says a lot about her strength and resiliency because many of our kids can't, and it doesn't make, it does, it's not their fault, right? Um, but that's right. just, well, that's she, just do, it let is. me, let me clarify. She loses it at school too. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. but the, the pockets of time where she's is mostly spent at school. And then I get that, hold on a second. I get the challenging, um, she won't stop talking to me. So anyway, but yeah, she, <laughs> she loses yeah. it at school too, but the at home, it's like, just lose it. And yes. there's not even enough time for the good time, right? Because yeah. we're getting ready for school or we're getting ready for bed. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, um, you are not alone in that experience. What I always encourage parents to think about, especially as we start school again, especially after a year where many of our kids have been out of practice and going to school, and learning how to be in school, right, um, is so good. Again, accommodations, what can we do ahead of time to prepare for how we know that our child's brain will respond and what they need? And so any of those expectations that we have in the evenings, right, to center ourselves as much as we can if we have an opportunity to do that before they arrive home so that we're grounded as possible in a most resilient place as we can be, so that we can provide them with that grounding, that co-regulation and help them reset, right? That that's first and primary and um, things like, you know, do your chores, hang up your backpack, sit at the dinner table, all of those seemingly easy tasks that shouldn't we think require anything of them, knowing that that is such a huge weight for them after they've just come out of that environment. So, and letting just, go of those expectations. <laughs> just to yeah, piggyback on what Hillary said, um, I'm sure a lot of people will, this will resonate with them, but um, my, my daughter's school, I had a huge, uh, for three years, I fought them to get her out of that school and, you know, they weren't very supportive, but one of their main things that they always said to me when I would talk about behaviors at home 
well, that doesn't happen at school. That's not how she acts. And like, if I would have known, if I would have heard this, then, then maybe even though I was saying like, but you need to help me and she needs help. Like it makes so much more sense now, you know, like, because I could have, I, I feel like I could have pushed back on them more with a little bit more knowledge, which is what I was doing anyhow. But, you know, but that was like, I would be like, stop saying that. <laughs> like, yes. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah, I mean, she's working all day to perform for you. And now she's just melted down when she's got home. And that's why I'm seeing all the behaviors. Like it makes total sense. Yeah. Good. I'm glad. Yeah. So much of this is about us finding the language to describe what we knew intuitively or in our gut or whatever it might be. Right. Um, to then help others shift their lens. Right. So that, that of course gets easier as we deepen our understanding, then we have more language to help others shift their lens as well. But I'm glad that this is helpful um, in getting some language around this and what it might be, what might be happening. All right, so the third part, which we didn't, we haven't talked much, well, we haven't talked at all about, we won't talk much about, are these tertiary symptoms. And I don't know what your experience was in terms of your child receiving their diagnosis and then you pursuing information like good parents do. (laughs) about, oh my goodness, okay, it has a name. So I'm going to go and figure out what to do. Like we're going to do this, right? Um, My experience and with so many of the parents that I work with, regardless of their child's diagnosis, much of it is about, this is what your child is at risk for. These are all of the negative outcomes that they will likely experience or may experience. And there's very little said about what we can do about it. That was so incredibly frustrating and disheartening to me. And this was what I read about with my daughter was she has fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and she will be at higher risk for legal system involvement, addictions, mental health diagnosis, trouble at home, trouble at school. I mean, it just went on and on. And the only thing that these books and experts would say about what I could do about it was a loving, caring environment is important. (laughs) And I just thought, yeah, check, like we're doing that. (laughs) And it ain't working, right? Um, So What I want you to know here is that yes, when our child is, lives in a world where they are not understood, their differences are not understood and there are no efforts to accommodate them because their disability isn't recognized, then that chronic poorness of fit for years and years and years and years can result in some really difficult tertiary symptoms, right? Interactions with systems um, in ways that are not positive. What I also want you to know is that there is way more hope for our children than we are ever led to believe. And there is so much that we can do about it to prevent these things from happening, okay? Now, if your child is older, for example, and you have been parenting them with very good, loving parenting techniques because you didn't have any other information provided to you. And you feel now as we're going through this training, like, oh my goodness, I can see the ways that I didn't accommodate for all these years. You have to be gentle with yourself. You have to practice loads of self-compassion because beating yourself up in that reflection is not gonna get you anywhere. The other piece to that and also, There is so much hope for your child too, right? What I would, if you are in that place, what I would encourage you to be mindful of is that you didn't get here overnight like this, right? Whatever that looks like in your home, you didn't get there overnight that developed over time, right? And so it's not going to dissipate overnight, but it can dissipate, right? And I've had parents who once they start parenting consistently, 
say they have a teenager from this perspective and they start to see that happening, they almost get scared <laughs> because they just can't believe that it's actually happening. And what I say to them is there's no reason why that can't just continue. Our child has the opportunity, the ability to settle even more and more and more as time goes on. Now, it doesn't mean that there won't be like these spikes because when they say starting school, for example, after a year of not being in school, for example, like that might be a poor fit for them, right? It might be an adjustment. It might um, not be in line with the way that their brain works until they're able to kind of settle into that routine. So we know, okay, yeah, I see the spike, but I know why it's happening. I don't have this rising panic about like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, here we go again. It's like, oh yeah, yep. Kind of expect that because of these things, right? And I know how to accommodate, how to help settle, how to co-regulate to bring them down so that you're not in that state for maybe as long as you have been in past times, okay? So I wanna make sure that we understand this tertiary symptoms piece, but I also want to make sure that you really understand it, right? In its fullest, fullest context, that it is not inevitable. All right, so the traditional parenting approach, this is kind of what we've been talking about, right? The last session and, and today as well. Um, the problem definition for the traditional parenting approach are behaviors are willful and intentional, right? And our goal in that traditional approach, no matter what it is that we're using those techniques there underneath that you can see is to stop the behavior. Like that's what we go after. <laughs> that's where our energy is, right? Whatever I can do to just make them stop, right? So how that clashes with our child, our neurodiverse child, is that the focus is on behaviors, not the brain differences, not the source of the behaviors, not those lagging skills. Um, that those traditional approaches, those techniques require complicated cognitive skills to be effective. Even just some of you mentioning your child um, parroting what they've heard, right? I think of this as like the zones of regulation too. Zones of regulation is a wonderful way for uh, neurotypical children to understand what they're feeling inside. But if you have a child who is not able to um, put into place those complicated skills of regulating enough so that their thinking brain stays online, so that they can reflect and check in with themselves, <laughs> you know, all of those kinds of stuff, they're not going to be able to tell you probably what zone they're in. Same with calling upon coping skills. Like, man, they've been given so many coping skills, they never use them. Well, what cognitive skills does it take for your child to use that coping skill in the moment? It's really complicated, right? We talked about why consequences don't work um, if they can't link past experiences to current experiences, so on and so forth. So um, com complicated cognitive skills, if our child doesn't have them, those techniques are not going to work for them. Interventions rarely consider our child's unique brain function. Again, it's only focused on the behavior and it sees it willful. I just want it to stop because they're doing it on purpose. And it does not take into consideration the parent-child relationship. And again, I keep saying, we'll talk about this more next time, but that is really getting at how connected are we to our child and how able are we, how um, capable are we in those moments of providing them with co-regulation and why does that even matter? I don't know about all of you, but I never heard about co-regulation. It is our greatest parenting tool and I've never heard about it until I started um, parenting my very neuro neurodiverse child and thank goodness had people who knew a lot more than me <laughs> to help me learn about it. All right, so now we are gonna talk about accommodations, okay? So if you were able to print out that grid, I would encourage you to get it just so that you can reference it, take little notes on it um, if you want. If you didn't, no problem at all. Um, everything that you need will be here. And of course, um, the handouts are there at a later time and you'll get the slides and all of that kind of stuff. So we've been going to accommodations. I've been giving you little examples of how accommodations fit into, the, into this. Um, so it's not gonna be news to you to see this, that they are the treatment and the intervention. 
So when we talk about what works for our child, what therapy works for them, why doesn't this therapy work? Why doesn't that therapy work? I always try to bring parents back to accommodations. Like you want a therapy for your child because you are good, loving parents that want to help them. Accommodations, <laughs> right? That those are what help our child settle and be more successful. They are the path towards less challenging behaviors. So here is the process. And then we're going to spend a lot of time going through the process in much more detail. But the overview of it is if you start there in the top left-hand corner, um, outside of the moment, observing what happened and reflecting on that. So what led to what? Where did I notice the faintest signs of agitation in my child? It's usually way, 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 way before the actual challenging moment. Um, what happened with me? How did I respond? What worked? What didn't? What would I do differently next time? Right? All of those questions. Um, I didn't send an observation um, prompt log in this last email, but I'll make sure to do it in this next email so that you have um, some ways to get started in this practice. I would encourage you to try to be as consistent as possible, especially as you're climbing this um, steep learning curve in taking five minutes a day to reflect and observe. And I would encourage you to not spend more than 10 minutes a day because we can definitely get lost in what kind of happened, especially on a challenging day. And we don't have the energy for that and the time for that. And I don't know that it helps us to spend, you know, copious amounts of time. Five to 10 minutes is plenty. Um, but what you're trying to do here is develop habits and stay in that neurobehavioral lens for longer periods of time. <laughs> And this is going to help solidify it for it for you, right? So again, outside the moment, we do not develop accommodations in the midst of the challenging moment. It's too late. Don't, don't go there. <laughs> it's not going to work. Okay. Um, so observation, reflection, brainstorm accommodations, implement them. What worked, what didn't try again. Okay. So as you get more familiar with your child's unique brain function and you see the lagging skills that are consistently in their way, then this starts to happen automatically. It has been years and years and years since I've gone through like a formal writing it out reflection process. The accommodations are just more automatic, right? I do have conversations with my husband in the evening after challenging day, like, man, that was a challenging day. Like what happened? You know, and we'll have a discussion about what we saw what we think might be behind the behaviors, but that's about as formal as it gets, okay? So if you can commit to the practice now, I promise you it gets way easier and you don't have to do that forever, okay? All right, so there's a series of questions that we go through when we're developing accommodations. And again, this won't always be the rigid process that you follow, but in the beginning, I really wanna encourage you to stick to this rigid process. <laughs> So I will tell you, I rebelled against this when I first learned it because I am just not rigid in that way. Um, and I'm really glad that I had someone that held my feet to the fire because it really helps with the learning curve. Some people love this. They love the structure. They love kind of the step-by-step -step process. So wherever you fall, just know that it's, I'm again, gonna encourage you to stick with it. We ask a set of questions and we ask them in this order, okay? So what is the task or expectation? that your child is expected to do or to meet. When we ask that question, again, we'll practice this in a minute, we wanna make sure that we're not taking too big of an expectation, um, that we wanna break it down into bite-sized pieces. What I mean by that is if you say, the expectation is that my child does their bedtime routine without me asking, that's too big because Inside that bedtime routine, my guess is there's probably, I don't know, three or four different tasks that they have to complete. And it could be all of them that's tripping them up, but it might just be one. And oh my gosh, wouldn't that be wonderful if you figure that out because you've divided them up, you've accommodated for that one, and now things go much smoother most of the time, right? 
what does anyone's brain have to do in order to complete that task or meet that expectation? So we're not thinking about your child. We're talking about all of humanity. <laughs> so that, that task or expectation that you've just listed, what are the brain tasks involved? What would you have to do? What would I have to do in order to actually complete those? And you just brainstorm, right? That, that can be would the, be the primary characteristic. Well, it would, it would be oh. primary characteristics as applied to everybody. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so you can look at the primary characteristic, yeah. the list to, to get some ideas. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. Where you then bring in the screening tool specific to your child is what do you know about your child's brain function and these cognitive skills? So it's, it's nice because you have the test, task or expectation, you have the skills, cognitive skills that are required to meet that. And then right next to that, you have a side-by-side -side comparison of, does my child have that skill? So say you have a long list of executive functioning skills, you go to the screening tool and your child has all fours and fives. It's like, oh, oh, okay. Now I see where the disconnect is. Now I see where the poor fit is. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions about that? And again, we're gonna go through this several times. But those three things right there, the task, what brain skills are involved, does your child have those skills? That is more information than anyone ever asks about our child. And it is critical to our understanding of them. It's like exactly what we should be asking about them right? But rarely is that information asked at all. And it certainly isn't at the forefront. So it's really important to start there. Okay. How old is your child developmentally? Again, don't get bogged down in this. Like, ah, oh, is it five? Is it seven? It's just like in general, what age do they remind you of in this situation with this task? Okay. What secondary behaviors do you see with the, in relation to this environment or this task. Those are usually really easy for us to list. <laughs> those are usually not ones that we have to search for. Um, what I will say is that oftentimes when we're looking at our child through a behavior lens, that is where we start, right? So you see one, two, three, four, that's the fifth question in this process. Usually it's the first, and that's when we jump to um, behavioral lens techniques, right? When that's where we start. So based on all this information, what accommodations can we brainstorm to help child be more successful and settle in this environment? So again, that is easier done with people who understand this information in the same way you do. So I can tell that many of you know each other already. Wonderful. Now you're going to have this information and you can connect and talk about this and help each other brainstorm. Okay. Okay. Um, if you are in a parenting partnership and they are um, wanting to be um, informed about this lens as well, awesome. Um, hopefully they can watch this recording and um, then you can brainstorm together, right? It's just so much more, it's just, it happens so much more easily. That steep learning curve is not so steep when you have other people that are helping you brainstorm with you. Okay, so if you have the grid or you had a chance to look at it, this is what it looks like. And at the top there, it's helpful to put the setting, helpful to put the chronological age, and then again, the developmental age, um, just as a reminder, right, that our child is a different age many times than their chronological age. So I'm going to go through how to complete this grid. Um, if you're already feeling the weight of the rigidity of this, just take a deep breath, <laughs> stay with me, okay? Um, we're gonna go through and complete this. Um, I will say that these situations that I'm about to go through are very cut and dry and they're very clear. And the reason for that is that I just want you to be able to know the process. Um, obviously our real life situations are not always this clear, okay? So this child who's six in school, the teacher says, I just want them to listen um, because that's how they learn, right? That's all I want them to do. Well, what is 
one thing that the brain has to do in order to learn by listening. They have to be able to have auditory processing that moves quickly enough to stick with what the teacher is asking them to do and saying and teaching, right? So again, I've just listed one here um, just because I want to make sure the process is clear. But here you would write any of them that you could think of. So this parent and this, even this teacher, maybe the teachers completed the screening tool. They look at, is my child able to process um, as quickly as we would expect them to? Nope, that auditory processing is a five. On, under that, I think it's language and communication, or maybe it's processing pace. Regardless, they say it's a four or five, and they say, oh, okay, this child doesn't have the skills to meet that expectation. And on top of that, we've agreed that they really remind us of a child who is like in a preschool. So that circle time, sitting quietly on the floor, sitting for 20 minutes of time and listening isn't really possible for my child who is really three, more like a three-year-old in this area. When this child is asked to learn by listening and they can't do it and they get in trouble and they're told to sit and they're told to quiet down, whatever it might be, they become frustrated. That frustration could look like rolling around on the floor, running around, throwing things, whatever it might be. But again, for simplicity's sake, we're saying frustration. We know that this child is a visual learner. These parents have put visual cues, reminders, prompts up in the house for different routines and have found it really helpful so that they know that this is accommodation that works. So the accommodations that they decide on are let's provide more visual cues rather than all auditory and let's slow down as much as we can while continuing to use that rich language. The reason why I add that is because a lot of times you'll hear use fewer words and I get the intent behind that to talk less, which I agree with, but we don't want to rob our child of rich language too. So when we're talking to them, use rich language, but slow down, know that maybe they're hearing every third word, give them time in between sentences to process what we're saying, that sort of thing, okay? So the other thing that the teacher is very frustrated with is that this child is not playing nicely. They're not doing a very good job in getting along with other kids. And she just wants them to do those things that kids six years old should be able to do, take turns, share, et cetera. In order to do that, the brain has to develop on time. If you can think of a better way to say that, let me know. It's really pointing to the dismaturity piece. We know that this child, we've already said, is more like a three-year-old in a lot of ways. We know what a three-year-old three -year looks like in terms of their ability to take turns, share, compromise. <laughs> um, when they are not able to do this, they don't get their way. They don't get what they want. There are temper tantrums. They're isolated because nobody wants to play with them. They become depressed. They are willing and they're relational. They want to be in relationship with other people. They want to have friends. And so adjusting those expectations, seeing them as their true developmental age. So again, not letting them get away with the behavior, but understanding that they still need to get a lot of coaching. They still need to have time away from the situation to be shown what exactly is happening. Why do we share? How do our actions impact others? But that is how they will learn. Last one here, following two to step, three step verbal instructions. We already know that, um, well, the brain has to be able to process quickly, has to remember those steps. Um, we know that this child, again, has slow processing pace, we've said that, and they have poor short-term memory. They can do one step, they wanna do that one step, they wanna follow directions, give them two, give them three, not gonna be able to do it. Again, a three-year-old, would we expect a three-year-old to do multiple steps? Maybe. But if they didn't do it, we wouldn't be like, you're doing that on purpose. It's like, ah, they're three, right? When they're asked to do two to three steps and they don't comply, <laughs> they don't follow the directions and they get in trouble, they become very angry, frustrated. They avoid the task that they were asked to do. Why? Because they get in trouble every time they try, right? They are doing as well as they can. 
we know this child is a visual learner, they want to please. And so giving again, more visual instructions, giving more time, giving one instruction at a time. Okay. Um, we're gonna do another example here in a moment, but I wanna pause there to see if there are any initial questions on the process that I'm walking you through. What is stretch toddler? It's, it's, um, it's just getting at the fact that um, this child is six, but really in a lot of ways, socially, emotionally, developmentally, they're more like a three-year-old. So a six-year-old or a three-year-old in a six-year-old body, stretch toddler. It's no clinical term. It's just <laughs> to, to describe it. I would it. <laughs> I, I get it like literal, like you stretch them and, you know, help them move, get some of their wiggles out. I like that. Yeah. We're going to go through another example. So hang in there with me, okay? We'll go through this, another, this next example, a different age, different things, different environment. Um, and then I think after that, we'll take a break. And then I want to come back and help you use your own examples. We'll go through a few examples that you all might have to help you again, start kind of plugging in the pieces here. All right, so this is at home and it is a child who is 11 going on five, okay? So um, an 11 year old, let's see a fifth grader, I guess it would be, um, versus a kindergartner. So the parents are very frustrated because they want their child to clean the room and they think that is a reasonable expectation and he just won't do it. Well, what does the brain have to do to clean the room? They have to understand, it has to understand the concepts, like what is a clean room? What does that even mean? And the parts that make up the whole, right? So a lot of times our kids, maybe they get the full picture, but they have no idea the pieces that make up that whole, right? They can't break it down. Um, or this concept that seems more abstract to them, they need it to be more concrete and literal, right? It could be all of that. And so the parents look at the screening tool and they say, oh yeah, okay. Lots of executive functioning fours and fives. They're unable to see the whole picture. That's probably where the poor fit is, or at least that's what I'm gonna um, explore more and see if that helps. They also know that their child, when it comes to tasks like this, they're more like a six-year-old. So what do we do with a six-year-old with chores? What are our expectations of them to do them completely independently? <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, when this task or expectation is put into place, there's always anger, frustration on the child's part, that secondary behavior. What the parents know based on previous experiences is that this child learns best by being shown, so not told, right? Then learn best by seeing and doing one-on-one, -on -one side by side. So many times we think our child is of a certain age where they do not need any more one-on-one -on -one side by side coaching. But what if, what if our child, even at 11, needs to be retaught many, many more times and also needs more of that one-on-one -on -one instruction, right? Lots and lots more than we anticipated. So that's part of the accommodations. Work together, again, learns by being shown one-on-one -on -one, side by side. So let's do Let's clean the room together. Let's pay, take pictures of the steps as we clean it so that that can be there for the child to reference later. Um, and what was the last one here I had? Need to reteach. Yeah. Knowing that it's probably not a one and done thing. So do your homework. This school has the expectation that every child will do some homework every night. And so... Um, what does the brain have to do to be able to do homework after a long day of school? We talked about the brain fatigue and how that gets the best of many of our kids. Um, so the brain has to have stamina or brain fuel, has to have the energy to do that after a day of learning, and it has to have working memory. It has to be able to remember what I learned in first period, for example, this 11-year-old would be in middle school, but for a middle school child, and be able to then apply it that night to the homework. This parent knows that their child gets easily fatigued from that brain, that brain standpoint and has difficulty recalling. 
right? They need to be retaught many, 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 many times before that information sticks. In this area, they're like, yeah, you know, with these skills, I would say he's more like a four-year-old than even a five-year-old. Um, the secondary behaviors are avoidance, refusal to do the homework, somatic complaints, right? From that anxiety, we can assume that sort of thing. The parents know that this child is a hard worker and wants to please. They want to do well in school. So eliminate homework. <laughs> My parents say, you can do that. I said, well, yeah, you could do that. That's a, an accommodation that is very appropriate for most of our kids. Um, getting the school on board can sometimes be a challenge, but heck yeah, it can be an accommodation. And then focus on relationship and resetting so that you have the evening, just like we were talking about earlier. If you know that your child doesn't have the stamina to do homework and now you're like this, it's taking your energy, it's taking their energy, right? You both are even more exhausted by the end of the night. How are they going to reset and be ready for that next day of school, right? So focusing on resetting and building your relationship and connection versus this, right? So the other task expectation is we have some really basic rules in our house and I just want him to follow them. They're not new. <laughs> he can talk the talk, but why can't he walk the walk, right? So remembering rules in different settings, that's one of the things that um, our brain has to do to remember rules. Like this rule applies in all of these settings, right? Taking a very specific and making it more general. We know that this child has memory problems. They forget, maybe they can't make that leap to apply one rule to different settings. In this case, they're more like a five-year-old. They become angry, frustrated. They have low self-esteem because they're always in trouble. They can't do anything right, right? We know that the parent knows that um, they want to do well. So accepting that they have significant, significant memory difficulties. And what does this mean, right? Providing visual reminders, again, of the rules and needing to reteach, okay? So I found myself in this situation with um, my 12-year-old just using the restroom and flushing the toilet and washing her hands. Like as a 12-year-old, <laughs> I did not expect to be reminding my daughter every single, every single time that this had to be done. And then my husband was like, why are we doing this? We should just hang a picture up in the bathroom. So when she's sitting on the toilet, it's right in front of her, right? She's there standing there looking at it. Do I like having that? It says her name so that it draws her attention. It has pictures because she's not a very proficient reader yet to reminding her. Um, it's not necessarily something I want in all of our bathrooms, but guess what? I rarely have to tell her, <laughs> right? So sometimes the accommodations are super simple like that. Um, it just takes us taking that step back, getting out of ourself, our reactivity that is so natural and so human, right? Um, to be able to develop these accommodations. Okay. Um, any questions before we take a break and then come back and dive into some examples you might all have. Crystal clear. Okay. So I'm just, I'm thinking about, and this is getting ahead, but when we're talking about IEPs and accommodations, how much you help change that in their own IEP. Like, do you let the team write it first and then kind of go through it? Do you do, so I'm not expecting you to answer this right now, but just kind of that's where my thought is. I know a lot of this is our things, obviously that we should be doing at home because then we can see whether or not that truly benefits our children, you know, if we're making these own accommodations. So I guess I'm just, I'm starting to, it's weird, I think way ahead of the cart. So. Oh, I don't know that you're, uh, that you are way ahead. I think it's a really appropriate question. And I, um, and it's, it's a important one. So a few things about that. One is um, there is no reason why the teacher can't fill out the screening tool. 
And if they're willing to do that, and if you feel like you can articulate to them the purpose of it, which I think you all can, I mean, it's really not super complicated, right? Um, you might have to go back and read the handout with the screening tool to remind yourself, but you all can do that. Um, if they are willing to do that based on their observations of your child in that very unique environment, wonderful. Because lots of different cognitive tasks and expectations of them than in school, than at home, right? So you could probably guess based on their lagging skills, you could probably guess what's getting in their way at school just based on what we know about how schools are run and classrooms tend, tend to go. But even more powerful and collaborative that they will fill out the screening tool. And then you have that common you know, foundation to start in terms of discussing your child's challenges and what to put in IEPs. And so the way that, um, the way that it typically goes is that the school does draft something first because they are going to identify what they see as the problems, <laughs> right? And that's how they look at it. These are the big problems that we need to have this child working towards resolving. I mean, really that's how they're mostly written. Like the child will do this, the child will demonstrate this, right? Wonderful to have those goals, but then what is the action that's there? Oftentimes it's about what our child will do. They will keep their hands to themselves. They will apologize when blah, blah, blah. They will, you know, and it's like, okay, yeah, those are, those would be really wonderful skills for my child to end up with. What are you going to do as the person in charge of the environment to make that happen, to set my child up for success? So that's where it gets kind of tricky is that's where a lot of the rewriting needs to happen is like, okay, goals are great. And I understand that. But now we know that my child is nowhere close to meeting that goal because of these lagging skills. And so what accommodations, scaffolding, whatever they wanna call it, can we put in place to help them be more successful? Does that help, Erin? It, it does help. And I'm just thinking ahead and I should give some background. So I am a speech pathologist who's been on an extended seven year maternity leave um, because, you know, kids. Um, so I've written plenty of IEPs and I look at this and just see like, this is like some of the easiest things to kind of be handed to someone to go, look, these are the strengths. And because that's a part of every mm -hmm. IEP anyways, is the parent input. And this is a perfect way to lay that out and to, to think about that as well as listing second or the primary characteristics and secondary characteristics of what they struggle with so that it's already there and kind of visible um, to teens, even if you can't fully yet get everybody on board with doing um, the this assessment for it, you can at least be providing that input for them to see and uh, documentation. Yeah, I love that idea. And even if you have that draft of the of what they've drafted already for the IEP, you can start to fill out this grid. And I think that's kind of what I hear you saying. You can start to fill out this grid. Oh, these are their expectations. Now I'm going to help illustrate what the brain has to do. And I'm gonna have, I'm gonna help illustrate where my child's primary characteristics are. And I'm gonna help illustrate. <laughs> and then you kind of take it these few steps further to help get to those accommodations. Is that? Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Great idea. Other questions about this process? Okay. Um, so again, if you like structure and things to be rigid and very clear cut, then this probably is a really joyful thing for you to have this tool. <laughs> if you're feeling constrained by it, like I was when I first learned about it, again, just knowing that when things are jumbled, when your emotions are getting, you know, clouding things, which happen to all of us, when you're like, like Jenny was saying, like, okay, I took, you know, I thought, what if, what if what? What do I do next? Right. But this is the structure that will help you get clarity will help you deepen your understanding, will make it so that this becomes more and more automatic so that you 
stay in that neurobehavioral mindset more often, we all fall into the behavioral lens pit that I call it. Um, so that's unavoidable, but the, 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 um, the goal is to, to not find ourselves there as often, right? And this structure really helps solidify that learning. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? So if you have your hard copy of this grid with you, then, um, you know, again, continue to take notes or practice filling it in with your own situations um, relevant to your child in your home or whatever it might be. I'm going to see if there are um, folks who would like to do this with the group so that we can walk through it with real life situations. And I know Nicole had emailed me about a situation. I asked her if she would be willing to um, use that situation as an example for this because it was such a good one. So I don't know if Nicole, if you're back with us yet. Okay. So I will come back to her. Sounds like maybe she is not with us yet. I will come back to her and open it up to the group to see if there is anyone who would like to take a challenging situation <laughs> that you have at home and plug it into this to brainstorm accommodations. Uh, this is Kathy Ferry. I have a, a situation coming up okay, that I great. would love insights from the group and from you. <laughs> okay, um, wonderful. We are uh, switching neurologists for Clarissa. And when, we're, when we set up the appointment, they told us that they want her to have an EEG to set a baseline EEG uh, with their practice, which is annoying for, she's 19 years old. She's had so many EEGs, you know, why they need another EEG, but, you know, I'm not sure if I'll be able to talk them out of it. Well, getting an EEG is like the confluence of every negative thing in Clarissa's universe mm -hmm. all together at once. And I know when days leading up to the appointment, the day of the appointment, and days after the appointment, uh, she has social anxiety. She doesn't like to be near new people. And in that case, of course, strangers have to be touching you. They have to be touching your head. She has extreme sensory issues about her whole head and her hair, her ears. She has extreme, uh, she does seem to legitimately have a very sensitive scalp. So it truly is painful to her if they get a knot in her hair or you know, trying to get the glue off. She has severe back pain. So sitting still for the duration of an EEG is physically painful to her. And then all the smells of the glues, the adhesives, the uh, solvents, the noises when they use, they often use a, a dryer to dry the solvent and things like that. All of that is extremely stressful to her. And it, it always ends up with a complete meltdown. She has to be physically restrained. She's screaming, crying. And then okay. that's what we're supposed to be doing to start our day at nine o'clock in the morning and then have an appointment with the neurologist two hours later. And frankly, I'm having panic attacks just thinking about it happening a month from now. Yeah, um, I can. So I'm in a situation like that where I know all the reasons why it's hard for her, but there are things that aren't necessarily things that can be changed. There's no way to get yes. an EEG without having your head touched. There's no way to get an EEG without having glue on your hair. There's yes. no way to get one. So if I can't, short of talking them out of it, how do I help Clarissa through the process? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think this is a great example because this is real life. <laughs> this isn't the sit still and listen <laughs> kind of example that I gave. So let's, let's walk through it and see what we come up with. Um, you have given a lot of information already about why this is so difficult for her, that it is not about unwillingness, that there are parts of this process and procedure 
that she can not tolerate. She cannot meet the expectation, right? And so you've also noted that some of those can't be changed because they're part of this process that she has to go through. And I assume that that's the case. I am obviously not a medical provider. I'm not trying to make suggestions out of my scope. But I think oftentimes too, we, um, we don't even think that far outside. Like, is this actually have to happen now in this time frame? Could it be, you know, a different time frame? And for example, the neurology appointment two hours later, does it have to be set up that way? Can they be spaced out a week apart? Whatever it might be. So just thinking about those things. Um, but sometimes we find ourselves in those, those places, right? Or we're in... Um, we're in the midst of, say, you know, a vacation or a family event or a group setting where it's like we're in it. There's not really a way to get out easily. And so how can we accommodate in those situations too, right? So you have a lot of information about how this has gone, what's hard for her. And um, so I would like to see if we can think of some things that might help it be less distressing to her, right? It may not be fully void of distress, but less distressing and for you too. So the task or expectation, it's getting this procedure done, but you've noted a lot of different steps involved, right? In that. And so that would be the first piece is to clearly write down. And so you have it all in your head to help ease your anxiety and to be more clear on what might be done, I would encourage you to write it all down, each step, right? And then this, and then this, and then this, because at each one of those steps, there may be something that can be done to help her um, experience less distress, be more settled. So um, why don't we start, why don't we pick three? If you're able to kind of highlight three pieces of this procedure that are really distressing for her or three different points in the procedure. And we can focus on those three. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, probably definitely the, the hardest part for her is just plain getting the leads put on her head. Okay. Um, which I guess that even could be broken down into say, um, you know, kind of separate the hair. They they part the hair in multiple ways, usually using kind of little Q-tips and mm -hmm. mark where they plan to put the leads. And and then they start with the adhesives and, and the glue and, and everything else. Okay. Um, so let's say put, putting the leads on the head, that's one task or expectation that she'll allow that to happen. And then tolerating the glue. And I know that you said there was an olfactory point to that too, right? The mm -hmm. smell is, is too much. Okay. And then is there a third piece that you want to add? How, I mean, the third part would, would be just tolerating the, the test itself. So sitting still through the, uh, the data collection. Okay. How, how still does she have to sit? Fairly still, they usually they usually do have uh, like a video or something that the kids can watch. But if they if they move very much, it interferes with the signal. Okay, uh, they have to be pretty still for the. Okay, process. and how long does it usually take? I believe they plan for this to be about a half hour long process. Uh, okay. You know, they can be anywhere from half an hour to we. Our longest one has been nine days, but. Um, Jeez. Half an hour okay. is pretty typical. What you're expecting. Okay. All right. So the task or expectation. So I want you guys to stay with us here because you're going to help brainstorm accommodations too. <laughs> so the task or expectation, she allows her hair to be parted and have the leads put on um, or allows, allows them to have the hair be parted. Um, can tolerate the glue and the leads being put on, I assume, with the glue and then sitting still through it for 30 minutes or around 30 minutes, okay? So what do our brains have to do? What would any of us have to do in order to tolerate those three things? Just what comes to mind for you guys? I sensory input, uh, the, just the sensory input of the hair being parted and 
the marks being in place. And, and that part requires you to be very still because they're very precise in where they need to put the leads and, yes. and measuring your head to get the marks in the right place before they place the leads. So sitting still and allowing someone to touch your head and um, manipulate your hair. Right. Yep. So you'd have to be tolerating that all the sensory pieces mm -hmm. required of that. Mm -hmm. You'd have to be able to stay emotionally regulated. That's executive functioning, right? So anxiety, distress, whatever it might be, frustration, irritability from somebody touching your head, you'd have to be able to manage that and still sit still. You'd have to be able to auditory process. What are they telling me to do? And then follow those directions, right? I don't know if they give her several steps at a time, but that might be another task that we would have to manage if we were in this situation, right? Others, any ideas about brain tasks involved in this situation? Future planning, being able to remind yourself while whilst you're doing all the other stuff you just mentioned that this is temporary and will be over soon. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, so there, may, there could be more than that, but that's a good start. And so we would write those down in the second column there, okay, to remind ourselves of what anyone's brain has to do to be able to tolerate this process. So what did you mark on your screening tool if you were able to complete the screening tool in terms of, or what do you know about her in terms of her sensory sensitivities? That would be a big one. Um, I would say um, the processing pace, that was another one, being able to listen to the instructions, take it in, make sense of it. Um, and then executive functioning, being able to forward think, being able to emotionally regulate, tolerate Those are frustration all extremely difficult areas for her uh, she okay. is very oversensitive to touch especially from strangers um, and very oversensitive to anything near her ears um, she's very easily overwhelmed by sensory stimulation so lighting in the room noises in the room can adding on to her already anxious uh, state. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the executive functioning, she she can't really the the forward plane that that's just not an option. That that's not something she's capable of. Uh, yep. Reminding herself that this is temporary and she just has to, you know, get through half an hour or you know whatever. That's she just cannot make her brain think that way. Okay. So it's very clear why this is a poor fit for her, right? Um, so again, things that you already knew, you came into this conversation articulating that to me, but I still want, even if that's the case for folks, I still want you to go through this process because it's like, yeah, I know these things are hard for her, but sometimes that doesn't help us then get to what, what exactly is hard about it, where I can then tailor the accommodations to that thing, right? And so we spend a lot of time trying things that aren't terrible, aren't completely off the mark, but if we could get more specific, our accommodations just get better. So her, her developmental age, social emotional age? Big picture, I would normally say about six, but probably with sensory things, it's probably lower, probably more like four. Okay. Maybe, maybe even lower than that, but. That's okay. probably her her biggest challenge is sensory. Okay, and she's a teenager, right? Is that she's what nineteen? Said? Nineteen, yeah. So, so this will be teenager. an adult neurologist. Yes. So, again, why we put the age there is to remind ourselves our child is a different age, and how would we support a child who was four, five, or six through this process? really, really, really different than a 19 year old, right? But that is what she requires because that is her age, right? Okay, so secondary behaviors, what happens when she's in distress? What, how do you, what are the symptoms that you see? She, well, when it, when it comes to sensory things, she 
uh, lashes out, she will fight tooth and nail. She'll try to kick. She'll be, you know, trying to move her head away from them, which of course makes the whole thing take longer. Um, she'll be yelling at them, screaming at them, and um, just getting extremely agitated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what are her strengths? And if you can relate them to this type of situation even better, but what would you, if you can't, that's okay. What would you say her strengths are? Um, she has, when she's calm, she has a lot of empathy for other people. She understands, she has kind of obsesses over medical procedures. So she understands what an EEG is and why it's important. So sometimes we can play off of that if we can get it early enough before she panics. Um, I guess we've had some luck if we have the right EEG tech where they can distract her talking about her hair and uh, you know mm -hmm. talking about different ways to fix her hair or things like that. Sometimes we can distract with beauty talk. She wants to uh, you know connect with young girls you know close to her age talking about style or beauty or things like that. Language yeah. is her biggest strength. She she's very verbal. Okay, great. Those are some great strengths. All right, so based on all of that, then we wanna brainstorm some accommodations. Um, before we do that, my first question is, are you able to be with her in this procedure? Do you anticipate that? I, I, I will insist on being with her, yes. Great. <laughs> So I'm saying we wouldn't let a four-year-old yeah. go, right? By ourselves, so great. Okay. I would because... love to not have to be with her, but I will be with her. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I get that. Totally get that. So um, so I wanted to ask that question so that when we think of accommodations, we can know that you're going to be there to help provide. I mean, that makes that makes then the accommodations we can expand, right? <laughs> um, on them a bit that way. All right. So for those listening, we talked about the primary symptoms involved, where the poor fit is for her, right? Why she's having such clear signs of distress when she has to get this procedure done. And so looking at that, those primary symptoms, how might those be accommodated? Did anyone have any ideas that came to mind as you were listening? One thing that I was just kind of thinking, and I don't know how, how far out the EEG is and I sympathize because my daughter has a two to three day EEG coming up and pretty much everything she's younger she's only almost nine but exact same things but wondering if you could request like I said I don't I don't know the situation but if you could request a female EEG tech and just kind of give them a heads up before you come in you know it's super helpful if we can request someone who can talk to her about her hair and beauty and just maybe explain the situation a little bit. And they may not be able to provide, but if, if they are aware of how stressful it is for your daughter, mm -hmm. if they could help find a female EEG tech who knows going in that distraction and beauty and talking about hair and things could make it easier for her, then I found some some places are more likely to really try to accommodate if they know how stressful it is for your daughter to have to go through that and if they could know going into it some techniques that they can do because it's it's going to make their jobs easier um, as well if they can do things knowing going into it how to help her through it and how to distract her and some things that you found helpful I, I do plan to, uh, well, first call and really push the idea, do we really need to have another EEG? It's not going to change your diagnosis. Why do you need an EEG on her just to see her for the first time? Um, but also, if I can't convince them otherwise, I do plan to um, express very clearly our concerns and make sure they understand they need to allow a lot of time because she may need breaks. Um, we did have one occasion where the technician 
uh, braided her hair before they started doing any of the leads in a way that had her hair kind of out of the way of where they needed the leads. So less glue was, was caught in her hair and it was um, easier for them to get their measurements because her hair was contained. She has relatively long hair. Uh, her hair was contained, but it also made it, um, you know, they didn't have to sit there then parting it while they were marking and putting the glue in and, and things like that. Uh, so I definitely will uh, see if that's something they're willing to do, or I'm, I may braid it myself the day before. Um, Love it. But I, of course, I don't know exactly where the leads uh, go. So it would be better, frankly, if they could braid it. Yeah. Yeah. And I would, I mean, I, I think it's a wonderful idea. That is an accommodation, right? Talking to the people who hold the power <laughs> and asking exactly for what you need. And saying to them, this is, I mean, using the word accommodation, this is my child's diagnosis. What this means is that these, she cannot tolerate these things. And these are the accommodations she requires to be able to do this procedure. And the reason why I'm talking in that way, and maybe that would be the way that you would talk about it is just for anyone in the group. When we oftentimes, when we have a child who has an invisible disability, even if, even if it gets very obvious in some situations, we still kind of lightly tread on like, well, it'd be great if it was possible, if <laughs> it's like, nope, this is their, this is their permanent physical disability. This is what they require. I would appreciate these accommodations, right? Oh, you can't have it in place by next week. We'll, we'll, we'll wait. Right. And to really be as kind as possible, but also gentle persistence, right. Um, to feel really confident in that. Some of the things that you talked about were those sensory pieces like the bright lights or the smell. And I'm wondering if there are accommodations around that. And if she, this might, it might, it might increase her anxiety to do this. And so of course, in that case, you don't want to, but if it would help ease her anxiety to say, you know, these are the things that you've had trouble with before. The smell of the glue is really awful. The lights are too bright. Are there other things you can think of that are really distressing for you? And let's talk about what we can ask for. That might help her. It just depends on your child. But things like in those accommodations saying to them, the lights need to be dimmed before she gets into the room. And um, you bringing something that has a, a pleasant smell, having that in your purse or whatever to help give it to her when she needs it. Yeah, those are just, um, you know, maybe they won't work for your child. You know her best, but these, this is the brainstorming piece, right? That we're talking right. about. Kathy, um, another thing I, I thought of as well is I know, you know, my daughter also had a lot of hard times with all the EEGs and throughout different places that I went to, to get the EEGs. Obviously when we have the longer day ones, they tend to glue them and stick them on. And the routine ones are more of like a paste. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times the paste ones don't smell as bad and they don't have to dry them. But I know that I've been to different places where they've applied them. And I was pleasantly surprised at like, even just the paste smelling different. So maybe you can, you know, call ahead and when you um, ask about, you know, a female doing it or a female being in the room, you know, maybe one of the things that they can do is while they're marking the head and separating the hair, it could be like they're doing her hair, um, you know, and, but they're really marking it and she might not even notice as much. But you could also maybe ask, you know, what kind of glue do you use? Because my daughter has you know, this sensitivity and they, they may choose to use one type of glue because it's easier because it works better, but they might have another one that they could suggest or use that, you know, they wouldn't have. Right. That's a good point. I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but we do a lot of bribes in our house. So when, when our son has to have an EEG, again, it was a nightmare. And, um, but we had little prizes for at each step to give him. So if that's something that is okay, then maybe look little beauty products and stuff. All right. It might be possible. I did mention to Clarissa, I said she's been 
she knows that we're switching to a different neurologist and she knows that it will be in, down in Charleston. And when she was young, we went to a, a neurologist in Charleston and we had the practice of after her appointment, she would go to the aquarium. So she's looking forward to go, going to the aquarium. So I tried to kind of uh, use that and say, now, you know, they might make you get do an EEG, but you know, you have to really try hard to not get upset or it will be hard for us to go to the aquarium. And she just looked at me and she said, mom, you know, you know, I, I can't help it. My anxiety just gets too bad. I can't yeah. help it. If I could and do better, I would. Right. You know, this is, she just was very clear. It doesn't matter what you tell me I'm not, I'm going to miss. I can't control myself during this up during this uh, procedure, and I felt bad. But you know the things that I would normally do to help with her anxiety, I don't think they'll. Well, I guess when I know she's having a medical procedure that she'll be anxious about, we have a prescription for clonopin to help control the anxiety. Well, that I suspect they'll tell me I can't give to her because it would affect the EEG, and so. You know, some of the things that might normally be beneficial to help manage a situation that I know is going to be overwhelming for her, I will be probably limited on. So I have to think outside the box and come up with other um, yeah. uh, options. Kathy, is this Can happening I at a hospital? It, it will be at MUSC. Um, it, so I don't so think do it will be mean, in, the, in the hospital itself. I think it will be in the affiliated uh, medical the, uh, offices. Uh, uh, ancillary. So do you remember in pediatrics, they have their staff that help with this and it depends on the facility as to how robust that is. I would imagine some maybe non-existent, but most of them have some version of in pediatric world It's called child life. Mm -hmm. I mean, nursing homes have it, everybody it's, it's, it's client, uh, it's basically the emotional well being and how they're interfacing with the technicians and practitioners. And they will create like basically a behavior plan, but like a, an intervention plan for whatever the procedure, right? So um, you might reach out and see what the adult version of that is. Um, and it, it may not be a very formed uh, department since it is adults, right? But I think that people like your daughter and all of us here by doing what we're doing and implementing these things into our actual life, that we are starting to tell, we are helping to tell the industry, this is a huge need that is not met. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is it's so hard. It's so hard with the EEG because EEGs are just veritably worthless. They are veritably worthless and every epilepsy parent knows it and every epileptologist and more so general neurologist is just in love with them for no good reason. So just as a friend, I would like to validate and support uh, your feeling like it's pointless and that you shouldn't have to do it. And when I feel that way, specifically, especially about EEGs, I approach it one of two ways. If I, I flat refuse, if I can, you have to give me a very clear reason why we would do it. If it's not going to change treatment or anything, then no. And if they say, then you don't get the appointment and I really need this particular, you know, practitioner, then I will go to the appointment and take her through it as far until I feel the boundary of, you know, trauma happening has been met. And then, so the same as if someone's trying to get an IV and you're like, how many times are you going to let this junior, you know, junior nurse poke my kid only so many times before I say, I'm sorry, I know you're trying, please get, get the good, you know, get the specialist. Every, every shift has one. I feel the same way about the EEG that there would be a limit where I'd be like, you know what, she's too upset and, and your methods of being able to carry on with this appointment are failing and I don't have anything else I can do either. So we're going to leave and then they can tell the doctor and I would also get video because then that would help for any further 
if you can be if you can say like you're you're insisting on this test look at what it's gonna look like is it worth mm -hmm. it you know those are my five cents on that so i want to i want to just kind of organize the feedback that folks have given so far so that we so that it's clear here in terms of what you might pursue so one is about questioning um the procedure at all like due to her inability to meet so many of the expectations, how necessary is it? That's obviously a doctor conversation, um, but feeling empowered to have that conversation. Um, the other piece is about whether or not to involve her in the plan. And it sounds like you've talked with her already about it happening and that she understands how hard it is for her. She, if she could do better, she would. And so would it help her to be more settled if the two of you created a plan together? plans help us reduce our anxiety, right? And I'm concerned about you too, in terms of your level of anxiety and trauma around it. It's very understandable that you have that, but would this plan help both of you to have a little more groundedness through the situation? And then that, that plan focusing on the sensory pieces, it seems like that is like what's rising to the top, her distress around the sensory pieces. And you have some wonderful ideas about how to manage the hair before, after asking for a tech, that um, you know is known in that clinic as the go-to person with kids with her type of needs, that kind of thing. Um, if you don't ask for it and they don't know you need it, then it's probably not going to be the match, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and then just going through each of those sensory things, like we said, the lights, the smell, the touch, um, it may not help her alleviate all of her distress, but maybe with these sort of things combined can help to stress it. The other thing is um, in, like I would be, I would, I would encourage you to think about, and we don't have to go down this path right here, but encourage you to think about when she's experiencing distress, are there things that you know help her settle again and keep her grounded? Like is touch one of them or not? Um, you know, um, we talked about bribes and whether they work or not. I think actually the way that I would look at it in the way that it was described, I forget who had mentioned it. Um, yeah, there we go. That it's just, that can be a form of distraction too. Um, so it's, it's in the moment when you're distracting with a toy or something they're interested or play or goofiness or a joke or whatever it might be that kind of helps her shift. You know, we talked about those loops that our kids get stuck in. Is there anything like that, that you can know ahead of time? Like you've already brainstormed that. So you're not in the moment when your anxiety is, you know, probably starting to amp up, you're not having to come up with those ideas, right? I like distraction much better than bribe. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. No, so. I, I will definitely, her, a big um, calming resource for her is listening to music through her oh, earbuds, great. which also helps, of course, el eliminate the auditory sensory info, input. Fortunately, there isn't a lot of instruction that she has to follow other than staying still and you know letting them move her head the way they need. So they won't be trying to talk to her very much. Um, it's just a question of getting her adequately um, absorbed in something. It's that balance of letting her be, lose herself in her music so that she mm -hmm. can uh, kind of pretend she's in a different world versus distracting her from what's going on mm -hmm. because I don't think the music will be enough to keep her. Yeah. Uh, right. Right. And maybe, and maybe having that realistic expectation that it's not going to be a complete 360, 360 shift for her. Like that's, right. that's asking too much of her, but that if you can get her to the 180 and then you're there with a solid plan, feeling much more regulated so that you can support her much more effectively, right? If we're not anxious and that kind of thing, that we can help them co-regulate. You've got a plan, so you don't have to think about it in the moment you follow your plan, um, that maybe that will be enough, right? So the other things that we haven't talked about is day beforehand, how to help her get her brain to fuel tank as full as possible, the rest of the day and maybe even the next day, how to help her reset. So rescheduling that appointment, like why does it have to have to happen the same day? They maybe did that for your convenience, but maybe it's not not understanding that it's actually super inconvenient. Um, those sorts of things. Okay. Right. 
So, well, do you mind, do you want to share when it is a few weeks from now, a week? It's um, right now it's scheduled for the beginning of October. Um, okay. So we do still have some time to work mm -hmm. with the office to try to Great. Um, hopefully get them to buy into some accommodations and, or maybe even better, uh, hopefully convince them that it's not needed at all. Yeah. Um, but, okay. Uh, Great. Yeah. So the other folks in the group, again, I mean, I can tell you guys know each other outside of this group. And so be thinking of Kathy in October and Kathy reach out to your other folks here if you need to brainstorm more accommodations or fine tune it right mm -hmm. um, or be reminded of what we've talked about <laughs> sometimes we miss it okay all right thanks for sharing that that was a great example so I know is uh is Nicole with us now yes I'm here sorry I was awesome. having some oh that's okay that's you. okay that's okay. I called on you like the minute we started. So I knew that oh. you might still be <laughs> coming back. So I let the folks know that you had emailed me um, with a okay. situation. You agreed to bring it up to the group as an example. So um, do you want to just describe the situation and the task sure. or the expectation? Why don't we start there? Okay. So um, Sophia loves water play. So I enrolled her into an aquatic uh, OT program and our first session um, it was slow going. She's been a little over sensitive to uh, sensory stimuli lately. And, but when we were ready to leave, um, it was, it was very, very difficult, uh, physical, uh, uh, aggression, just, you know, wanting to hurt everybody sitting, um, trying to hurt everybody, not just me, the therapist and everybody. Um, so I, all I could think about was what could I replace? that sensation that she gets from the water and I can I stop you there yeah can I stop you because I'll and I'll take you through each piece okay um just so that it's clear in everyone's mind kind of the sure. order here so the the setting is like a swim place right a rec center a public yeah rec center okay and what how old is she she's 10 chronologically 10 and how old does she remind you of a socially emotionally a three-year-old okay mm -hmm. yeah that sounds like three-year-old behavior to me <laughs> Three and four, they're fun. Okay, so the task or expectation, what I hear you saying is that the expectation is she'll get out of the pool when the lesson's over. Is that right? Yeah. Or how would you describe it? Yes, that when the session is over, then we go through the whole exit process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And is it getting out of the pool or are there other steps involved, like getting changed and or is it really getting out of the pool? Like once she's out of the pool, it's like, it started okay. with getting out of the pool. Okay. Yeah. All right. So what does the brain have to do in order to leave something that we love that makes us feel good and transition to that ending and moving on? <laughs> I'm giving you guys hints here. <laughs> yeah, visualize what's coming next. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So know what those next steps are. Anticipate. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. what else do you guys have to do when you're in that situation transition transition and yeah. and knowing when you'll be back so you can look forward to it yeah so that is a great coping skill right when we have to leave something we love something that can help us regulate through that transition and make that shift cognitively from excitement and oh my gosh, this feels so good. I love it to like, oh, it's over. And that disappointment is being able to forward think and know that it will happen again next week. <laughs> yeah, great. Any others? What about the sensory piece of being in the water? I mean, we could look at it as another transition of like in the water kind of state to out, but what is our body need to be able to manage which is a brain thing with those sensory changes i think it might be helpful to be able to replace the sensory input of the water with another pleasant sensory input so if she mm -hmm. likes the feeling of the nice warm fluffy towel remind her oh let's go get snuggled up in our towel or if she likes to be hugged 
you know, incorporate that into drawing her off mm -hmm. when you get out and talk to her about that. So I love that accommodation idea. And I want to just, Kathy has done what I do all of the time still <laughs> in working with parents because we so, we so much want to get to possible solutions to help this parent and help this child not experience so much distress. So I'm going to bring you back because again, we're going to be super rigid here in going through these step by step so that you have the full information before we get to accommodations. So definitely hold on to that, Kathy. That was a great accommodation. Any other brain tasks that you guys can think of that we all have to do? I mean, we've we've listed quite a few. Would I would just say proprioception. Oh, would proprioception be involved in this? The kind the of marrying pieces. of the sensory, but with motor planning in a way. You know, like she's having to not just feel the the proprioception, you know, event, but react with it, with the water. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. 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 All of that sensory stuff. So Nicole, what do you, on the, on the um, screening tool, what do mm. you have for her? And I'll try to remember the ones that we mentioned transitioning, which is under executive functioning, being able to see what's coming next or anticipate um, her sensory seeking. Um, I mean, a kid who loves to be in the water that much is not sensory avoidant usually. Um, her ability to tolerate frustration or disappointment, which is also under executive functioning. What do you have for those on the screening tool? Oh, they're almost all fives. Yeah, that's her. Okay. Most severe all right. cognitive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So correct me if I'm wrong, but in our email exchange, it sounded as though um, you were clued into the sensory pieces and you'd been working really hard to accommodate for those pieces. But what mm -hmm. we've done now is expand it and say, huh, that probably is a piece of it. It sounds certainly like it is. And then also there's all these other pieces, right, that we could consider. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're like banging our head against the wall going, I know that this is what it is and I'm trying everything I can to meet that sensory need. Why isn't it working? It's like, huh, maybe there's more cognitive skills involved here that we need to consider, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so her age, three or four, how do three and four year olds, or you said three, so how do three year olds respond when they have to stop doing something that they love, <laughs> right? When they have to oh, disengage. Yeah, when they have to shift smoothly <laughs> without fuss. Mm, not very well. <laughs> yeah. Right. And as parents, we can, of course, become frustrated with our three year olds when that happens because we are human, but we usually don't panic. We're like, oh, yeah, man, this age is tough, isn't it? Right. <laughs> and we help smooth those edges for them. When our child is older, and they shouldn't be acting that way anymore. We usually then respond with force and exert our control, right? Because we think it, this is about willfulness. It's not about skill, right? So that's why we have that developmental age there is to remind us they are a different age. And maybe this is actually really in line with where their skills are, right? Secondary behaviors, you described those a little bit. Sounds like aggression, yelling, kicking, screaming, anything else? Do you want to add there? Um, Self-injury. Okay, what does that look like? Um, well, considering the location, um, she could have hurt herself in multiple ways just by swinging her body, being in the water, um, the hard surfaces, and then of course the seizure infection. Okay, okay. So it sounds like not intentional self-harm. It's more about not being able to see A plus B equals this terrible C and impulse control. Would you agree with that or disagree with that? Um, yeah, I can't say that she understands that the self-infliction of seizures is harmful to her. So you're probably, yeah, that's part of right. that. Or, or maybe, um, and I don't know, but for a lot of kids, they understand these things when their thinking brain is online. But if they're being asked to do things that they cannot do, and so they're experiencing secondary behaviors, distress, 
and their thinking brain is offline. And where we talked about their window of tolerance being like this, thinking brains offline, then they can't access all of that pretty common knowledge that they can tell you about <laughs> later, right? When they're doing better. All right, so accommodations, you guys. So Kathy, can you remind us of what you what you said? That was a good one, I don't wanna lose it. I, I was just suggesting looking for ways to replace the sensory input of the water with something else that she would uh, find pleasant, whether that's snuggling up in a warm, fuzzy towel or some deep pressure by, you know, hugging her while you're drying her off or some other thing that would just be calming, but also replace the sensory um, need. Okay, great. Other ideas? We're just brainstorming here. Jack too loves to go swimming and hates to get out of the pool. Um, and one thing that we've started to do is let him get out of the pool with the wheelchair chairlift, which he loves. So, and it's just enough of a distraction that by the time he's then out of the pool, you know, he's distracted and on to other things, but he, this is fun for him. So mm -hmm. good transition. I love that. So you guys might have remembered when we talked about getting stuck in loops or not being able to transition, that distraction and play are wonderful accommodations for that. It's often hard for us to get in that mode or I'll speak personally, I think I shared that when I'm like, let's go, we do this every time, come on, let's go. It's hard for me to get into a playful mood, but if I can, then that transition with that play, which can act as distraction happens much more effortlessly. So I don't know if Nicole, if that's something, if you're in the pool at all, it might be more difficult, but again, having like the swim instructor understand um, that this transition is difficult and that it's not about willfulness. And is there something they can do? Can you end with a game? Can there be some sort of thing to help market the end and the transition out that is more playful instead of like, oh, over, yeah. gotta go. <laughs> That's what got us out of that moment, actually. I Luckily, not. the therapist, oh, I guess the background. That's okay. The not. therapist um, okay. was very, I don't know, she put the animals all over and said, Sophia, I lost my animals. Can you help me go find them? And then we have to take them home to the locker room. And so that's how we got in the locker room. So that was genius. And we planned to continue that strategy as well. Um, but it. of course, drawing oh, out the whole nice. process is, I think, I think is genius and will help in the future. Yeah, so can you talk a little bit more about that? Because we did really quickly in our email exchange talk about these pieces, right? Um, and this idea of that so many of our kids cannot anticipate, even though it is this expectation that never changes, like this is how class goes. And every time class ends, and then we get out, <laughs> um, that they may not be able to see it coming. And so it's like abrupt and shocking to them and really distressing, right? And so one of the things we talked about was, would it help her to understand the steps and be able to anticipate with visuals? Um, so it sounds like you tried that, or can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, I did, and she really seemed to be very happy with the pictures and was excited about what I put that we would do after the pool. So that gave her a new focus. Instead of it being the pool is the primary she became very excited about what we were going to do after the pool. The issue we had last week was that um, she was just completely overstimulated. We couldn't even get in the water. We could, you know, she could barely move. Like it was very difficult for her. So um, we didn't have the issue to resolve, work through. Uh, we had other issues, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, so I started out like with the, getting into the car from home and then we drive to a building. There's a picture of a building. We go inside the locker room. We go to the pool where there will be Hannah and Sherry. We have 25 minutes of therapy. Write that down. Um, and we go into the locker room. We find Miss Sherry's animal friends and I do her little animal friends. And then we take them back to the locker room and then we go to the vending machine before we leave the building. 
and they go to the car and that's where she can have the treat that she's got out of the vending machine. So. Love it. I love it. And even if our kids can, even if your kids can read, oftentimes the visual is what they need. Like picture, it doesn't have to be elaborate drawings, it can be stick figures, but for them to be able be able to take what's so abstract to them and make it concrete so they don't have this anxiety about what's next, what's next. They can actually start to see it. Um, it's a great, a great suggestion. Wonderful. Any other ideas for Nicole accommodations? All right. So I appreciate both of those examples. And obviously, like I said before, if you guys think of other accommodations and you wanna reach out to Nicole or Kathy and let them know, I'm sure they would appreciate that. But now you also have a group of people who can help you develop your own. Um, again, highlighting starting in order <laughs> and going through this. The other handouts that you got that I um, didn't ask you to print have really detailed instructions about what goes in each of these columns so that you can reference that later, okay? So I'm gonna jump ahead here. All right, so I talked a little bit about observation. Again, just wanting to highlight that accommodations come from our observations, just as we've done. We're outside of the moment, right? They're not in the midst of the chaos with their child. Um, and that needs to happen. We need to do accommodations proactively. Um, it allows us to see without judging, to remain curious about what's happening, um, to understand where the fit is poor, be able to see where there might be some points for resolution, um, where we can build on connection, right? And so, um, like Kathy, when you were talking about, she's articulated to you how distressing it is. And even in that moment of her being in distress in the procedure, if it ends up happening, for you to be able to focus on building connection and em empathizing with her, right? That's taking a step back. Like she would do better if she could. Oh, this is so hard. I'm sorry, this is so hard. No matter how, you know, dysregulated she gets, like that is, that is so powerful for our kids, right? Focusing on that connection. Building on strengths so that we can actually prevent problems from happening and improve outcomes. So I was working with this family and, um, over many months, this was one-on-one -on -one work that I was doing with them. And um, they were doing great in terms of observation, reflection, you know, five to 10 minutes, most nights, um, really using the grid. And they had family come into town and their child was really dysregulated the whole visit. Even though he was excited about seeing these people, it was just hard. And they said it took them by surprise <laughs> that he had settled so much over time that when he had this escalation, they were like, oh my gosh, we just haven't seen that in so many months that it took us by surprise when that used to be what we saw every single day, right? So the difference is not, it doesn't say, oh, your child will never be challenging again. I just don't think that's possible. Um, but what I can tell you is that the intensity and the frequency can be diminished greatly. And there's no reason why that can't just continue to get better over time, right? So circling back, um, I have a blog post on my website about circling back if you wanna read um, that, um, just to kind of solidify your understanding of this concept. But why I include it with accommodations is because oftentimes um, it's like, well, where do we let our child know that that wasn't okay? Like what you described, Nicole, about you know um, screaming and yelling and kicking and being aggressive. Like, how do we begin to tell our child, like, that behavior is not okay. <laughs> and it really is through this circling back process. So it is a process that we facilitate with our child to talk about what happened. It's where we can instill our values, build their skills, which is what we want to do as parents, right? It is a multi-step process that takes place sometimes over several days. It has to be intentional and thoughtful. And um, it is not successful when we are dysregulated, which looks like anxiety, amped up, irritated, angry, whatever that might be, or if our child is dysregulated. And it goes back to this understanding that in order for us to be reasonable, we have to be regulated. In order for our kids to be reasonable, they have to be regulated, right? They cannot access cognitive skills involved in having a discussion about what happened 
when they are dysregulated and neither can we. So that is why we can't leap into conversation in the moment when something has happened and say, hey, you need to sit down. You're not going anywhere till we talk about this. I just don't want you to waste your precious energy doing that, right? I'd much rather have you find ways to regulate yourself. We'll talk about that next week. Let your child, you know, calm down. It may take a day, it may take more than one day, right? For them to be fully settled and then circle back and talk to them about what happened. Um, many times there are multiple things per day that we could circle back on. Don't do that. It's too much for you and it's too much for them. Um, it may feel uncomfortable, like you're letting some things go. This is how your child learns. They can't take it all in, right? And, and you don't have the energy to do that either. So pick what rises to the top, that one thing that day, that every two days, whatever it might be, and circle back with that, okay? Um, let's see here. This is why we do that. Because when we talk about what do we want to teach us, like, what is our goal as parents? This is what parents tell me, right? It's not to show our child that we have the power and control, that we can assort, assert our authority, we can take things away, we can bribe, we can, you know, give them consequences, whatever we want. That's not our goal. Our goal is for them to feel safe, for people around them to feel safe, for them to realize that their words are powerful, that their actions impact others, right? We want them to know what it means to impact others negatively and to feel that, to experience that remorse and to be able to make amends when they need to. We want them to show us respect and show their siblings respect and others around them respect. We want to feel connected to them, right? And we want to teach them how to better handle their emotions. They can have emotions. <laughs> But how do you handle them in ways that don't end up with the house destroyed, right? Or people um, feeling unsafe around them. That's the goal. And so when we circle back, that is where we can help our child build those skills. So it takes into consideration their lagging skills and those cognitive load challenges. So again, in the moment, when we're asking them to sit still, to listen, to emotionally regulate, all those things, there's more than that. Um, and um, they're already dysregulated, they just can't do it, okay? So when you circle back, when they are regulated and you lead with empathy saying, man, I could tell that you were having such a hard time last night. Um, and I, that just made me really sad. I'm really sorry to hear, to see that you were having such a hard time. So they're ye yelling profanities at you the night before, right? The next day you're recognizing they could do better, they would. There's something distressing happening. Maybe I know what it is, maybe I don't. But when you circle back, you lead with empathy. You want them to know that you know if they could do better, they would. That they're not this awful monster that yells profanities at people. Because that's probably how they feel many times, right? So letting them know, not even saying, when you were swearing at me last night, <laughs> and just say, man, last night was rough for you, I could tell. I'm so sorry that you were having such a hard time. That's a huge leap for a lot of us when we've been so set in a behavioral lens that it's willful and intentional. It takes a lot to, of stepping back to get to that place of leading with empathy. But the reasons we do that is that it allows their thinking brain to stay online right? If we're sitting down to talk to them after this awful night the night before, we want them to be emotionally regulated. Not like, oh, no, 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 I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. If we leap into like, hey, we're going to talk about what happened. Their thinking brain's probably going to be offline pretty quickly, right? So then once you're able to get that, and that may be all they can tolerate, especially if this is a new pattern for you in terms of your conversations with them, that may be all they can tolerate. And that's okay. You just let it be. And then you circle back again and say, you know, I know that um, I, I, was t I was saying how, how upset I was to see you so upset last night. Can we talk a little bit more about what happened and see if they can tolerate that, right? So it's the step-by-step -step process um, that then ends with us getting our concerns on the table. So this is how your words impacted me. This is how I felt when that happens. 
I know you could, if you could do better, you would. And also, I still need you to know that your words are powerful, right? So here are the steps. I've gone through them a little already. Leading with empathy, not focusing on the behavior and not making assumptions and not blaming, sharing your concern. And again, that's not blaming. That's not saying you shouldn't do this. It's disrespectful to do that. Maybe it is, but what's your concern about them being disrespectful? Are you concerned about your relationship with them? about this impact you know on other relationships what what is it try to really get clear on that and then brainstorm ways to accommodate and support them so you're not letting them get away with behavior that is not a part of the neurobehavioral model what it is is recognizing where that challenging behavior is coming from taking those steps back right to connect it to brain function accommodating so your child can settle experiencing less of that distress but also circling back so that you can talk to them, build those skills, help them get all of the context they're missing, help make the abstract concrete, right? All of that is necessary for them to understand that situation, but they're not gonna get there on their own. And they're not gonna get there by you just leaping into a lecture <laughs> in the moment of the challenging behavior, right? Let me see what I have here. Okay. Eileen, what if they aren't, what if they can't? get there from a con that's the conversation you're describing is mm -hmm. way elevated over my kid like yeah. she won't even let me talk so my question is how do you, you get your concerns on the table and have a learning moment with someone where like talking isn't an option what are the other ways mm -hmm. so that would be a great um, task or expectation to plug into the grid so that your task or expectation, the task or the expectation is that they, I don't know how you would describe it, that they participate in a conversation or um, that they- Yeah, information exchange. Information exchange, yep. Yeah. And so you go through that, right? Like what are the cognitive skills involved? Does, is she there? How can you, like how old is she developmentally when it's coming to having that information exchange, having a conversation? What accommodations can you come up with? If, if, if this process sounds really difficult for a variety of reasons, whether it's about their abilities or your ability <laughs> to be able to do it, I would encourage you to practice leading with empathy and regulating, helping them co-regulate. Now that's gonna require you to be in a spot where you're not dysregulated, where you are regulated and you can, you can go into it on solid ground in terms of a nervous system perspective. Again, we'll talk about that next week. Um, and focus on that and see what happens. And I know that it's going to feel for many of you, because I think this is a very natural response. It's going to feel like you're not doing enough. Like, oh my gosh, they just did this. And this is all I'm doing. But believe me, when I say you have to have that foundation in place to be able to move to any of these other steps, whether you do it through talking or visuals or um, you know, storyboarding together, whatever it might be. This kind of gets to what I was just talking about, that when we, you know, a, a very common and general accommodation, when we talk about, you know, talk, use fewer words or whatever it might be, um, accept the need to reteach. Adjusting expectations is one of them. And, um, when we have so many things that we could be tackling with our child, like there's just so much that they won't do, right? Or there's so much that they refuse. There's so much that results in escalation. Then to get really clear, again, I would write it down. And if you're in a parenting partnership, do it with your partner so you're on the same page about what expectations are going to be in place and what are we going to put aside for now. Um, and focusing on, it might just be one or two. So you say you have five expectations, you're like, these, this is all I ask them to do. And it's really reasonable and they won't even do this. Okay. I understand that. And also what would it be like to just take one or two of those, go through the grid, are the expectations in line with their cognitive skills, their developmental age, all of that kind of stuff, adjust, accommodate where you need to, and feel like those things are going well before you add in 
expectation three and four and five, right? So it's not about never ever having those expectations. It's about setting them aside because you can only tackle so much <laughs> at once, right? And what seems so simple and easy is just not. So it's not about giving in. Um, adjusting the expectations, like I said, is a thoughtful process, is something that we have control of and we do outside of the moment. Giving in is, I mean, we've all been there. It's, there's no shame or blame. It's just part of um, you know, parenting our kiddos is when we get tired and worn down and we're like, whatever, you know, that's giving in. We do it because of because of because we're tired. And we don't know what else to do. That's not adjusting expectations. Okay. So thinking about that, where might that happen? All right. I'm going to stop sharing my slides here so that we can come together again and chat a little bit before we say goodbye. Hard to believe we're almost our time again. <laughs> so thoughts on any of this. I know that we've had some points where we've stopped and had more discussion. So either on this last section or really any of these pieces that you're learning, is it coming together okay for you guys? Are there points of confusion, things that you're like, I don't know about that. <laughs> I was up with you until this point, and now I'm not so sure because <laughs> that's normal too. So I want to hear I think it all. Probably, at least for me, probably for a lot of us, it's what Hillary just said. The this all sounds great in theory, but having that kind of conversation with our kids just doesn't always resonate. And I could mm -hmm. try to have that conversation, but if she cognitively, because of the way her brain is, she just doesn't get it. Then yeah, you know we go through the same same behaviors and same things over and over again and I just don't know uh, yeah I mean I'm certainly going to try all this but we'll, we'll see how yeah. it goes <laughs> so what so let me ask this then um what happen what happens now what happens when those when that when a situation kind of happens uh, where they're dysregulated or they do something they're not supposed to how do you manage it now? Yeah, a lot of yelling. <laughs> I mean, it depends. I mean, some of it's just for us, it's a lot of the constantly touching us and everyone and bothering mm -hmm. her siblings. And her touching is often done in love, but it's very aggressive. It's kicking and it's just attention seeking. And it's one of those things we can try to talk about it over and over again. And Yes. You know, she, it's, it's impulse. She just, she can't control herself. She just wants to touch everybody and bother everybody so badly. And that's, so yeah, we're certainly going to be working on these things, but um, yeah, it's, it's a hard thing for her. Um, yes. Have, so hold on one second. Can you, can you hold that thought really quickly, just really quickly while it's still fresh in everyone's mind. What I want to make sure that we always distinguish from, cause it's real easy to get it, um, not to get it confused, but to think of it as the same thing is there's a few pieces we're talking about. One is developing accommodations. And remember that's done proactively outside of the moment. So Shannon, one of the things that I hear you talking about is how the expectation or the, the expectation is that she keep her hands to herself or she not do this to her siblings or she um, you know, not do this to the family pet. I mean, that's a big one too for a lot of these kids. Um, and so that's where the grid comes in. It's like, how can we, how can we help prevent that from happening? You know, you've talked about the impulse control that gets the best of it. Maybe her sensory needs, like her needs to be in contact with people. Maybe that's a piece of it. And so it may be more about what everyone in the environment does instead of what she learns to do at this point in her development, right? Um, and I hear you saying like, you've tried so many things and I mm -hmm. get that. Um, and I want to encourage you to use that grid and see what else might happen and work with folks in this group. The other piece is in that moment when it's happening, being cognizant of our child's cognitive skills and what actually is not even worth our energy. And so I hear you talking about that too. And I think Hillary, this is what you were getting at is like, is the circling back piece about having the conversation, is that worth our energy? because she doesn't have the skills to do it. Okay, so in the moment, oftentimes what we do is we talk and we try to reason and we say, why are you doing this again? That kind of thing, right? Is that worth our energy? 
Probably not. And so if it isn't, what can we do differently, right? Um, so I just want to acknowledge that, that yes, there are some things that aren't going to work depending on where your child is developmentally. And also, I think it's still worth going back and seeing, okay, based on that, those lagging skills are lagging way, 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 way behind. What else can we do? Does that make sense? Like the distinction between those? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I, can I tell you my kind of game plan for right now? And I'll be can brief. I, Hold yes, on one second, ahead. because there was someone yes. else who was going to stop yes, in, and yes. stop in, <laughs> jump in, and I jumped, I cut them off. So is it Bonnie? Um, yes. Yeah. Now, I just had a question because circling back, um, I can't do that with my child because he's four and <laughs> he's probably, the behavior is probably like 18 months to two years. And I don't think that he gets it so it, it would be a waste of energy and our time and everything so i didn't know if this is an accommodation or if this would be a continued waste of my time but my thought was would it be similar to circling back if you later practiced like whatever went wrong but you practice it kind of in the right way so if he has a you know uh i don't know something a um, like he bites a lot. <laughs> so, you know, if he does that, so instead, I'm like, oh, you know, I tell him I don't like biting, I don't want that. So if I stop, and I just say, oh, you can bite this. And like, so instead of saying circling back, like we shouldn't be biting people, you know, you were frustrated, and you did that. Um, practicing the appropriate behavior is that would that be similar without actually having to have that conversation? So I so I would be interested to hear what others think. I think so, because what would you do with a child who was 18 months to two years old? They punch, they bite. I mean, they, they do that stuff. Daycares don't usually call home and that happens at that age, right? I mean, they just, I feel, their, like, I feel so like how do you manage it? Yeah. I feel like if you're telling your child, you know, like my son bit when he was younger too. And I said, we don't bite people, we bite food, whatever, and, and make it, like you said, like a, a play or a distraction, like Amy mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and helping him understand, and it sounds like you did, like, ooh, ow, I don't like bite, that hurts. You can bite this, it doesn't hurt, you know? I mean, those... I think that it's hard because I've tried to do the, ow, that hurts, mommy. Please don't do that. That hurts, ow. And um, he's at that stage where if you say ouch or if you sneeze or if it's mm. any type of, it's funny. So He wants the um, reaction. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, he, so it's, you know, I think I try and st I, it doesn't work. Two things have worked for anybody that's still having biting issues because I eliminated it once, um, but it's not working as well this second time. Um, for him, he, you know, I think a lot of our Gervais kids are very affectionate. Um, and he, so also he likes to give kisses, but you have to be careful that they're not nibbles. <laughs> so um, a lot of times it's hard because you have to catch him in the act and he mm. gets excited and comes to you with his mouth open. He's angry and he comes to you with his mouth open. But what I do is if I can catch him in that moment, I say kisses, kisses, no bite, no teeth, mm -hmm. and he'll, he'll stop. Um, but yeah, I can't do the ouch thing because uh, we did that and it became a game. <laughs> so we, yeah, which also sounds like, yeah, a much younger child. So, right. Yeah, getting, interrupting his impulse control. I mean, that's, can't do that all the time, right? Because we're not on our toes all the time like that, but it sounds like you're doing an amazing job. So, uh, Bonnie, a uh, thought might be too, instead of the circling back in, in terms of um, conversation, uh, what if there um, is something sensory wise that he can bite? Like if you're, if he has any kind of chewy tube or like a, a chewing necklace or something. And so that when it's not in the moment of the frustration or tolerance that you're, you know, using that of whatever word you want to use, which might not be bite. Cause if you're saying bite this and later saying no bite, the only word he's hearing is bite could be. Right. And so then not understanding what the, the no or the yes is, but um, uh, maybe calling it chewies, you know, want chewies, um, chewy time, just to be able to give some of that input 
in a different sense or, you know, cause it could, it could potentially be a, a not just the frustration and the, um, the action of it, but just needing some of that, that sensory feedback. So if you were to go through the, the screening tool and you found that accommodation was he needed some of that feedback. If he was older, um, I would, you know, think about things like stale gummy bears, like maybe he needs some of that, like that chewing and, and sense sensation or just turning it into a game the next day in terms of the circling back, right? So that it's not in that moment of deregulation, but just doing different things of give kisses to bear, give kisses to this. And so that when you see that um, mouth coming at you and other times, like you said, sometimes you can say give kisses, no bites, but if you're just saying give kisses more frequently, so the word, words out of your mouth more often are kisses <laughs> versus bites, that might help um, just be some, some considerations for accommodations also, or just how to think of that circling back in a different way. No, I think that is good because before, if I think about when it when it went away, we tried to not say the word bite very much at all. We tried to say kisses, kisses, and try because my husband was really bad about saying don't bite, kiss, you know, give kiss. And I, I told him don't say the word bite. Um, but I think the one thing I didn't do, which maybe it will work better, I did try to do the replacement thing. I have the chewy tubes and all types of chewy things because he does like to chew on anything but food. Um, so. <laughs> But I will, um, and I, I was calling them chewies, but somewhere along the line, I think I have switched to here, bite this, bite, it's okay to bite this. And I know, like, you're right, he doesn't know the difference and it's okay to bite this and it's not okay to bite that. So mm -hmm. um, that is great, thank you. Yeah, it's great suggestions. All right, we have a few minutes left. I know Hillary, you were gonna add something. Yes, and Bonnie, this might, uh, help you too that what I was going to say about so my game plan but for stuff like that because I have the same problem mine is 12 but she just d talking is not an option right now and one of the things that I discovered pretty early on and have somehow I mean not somehow I know how but got away from was incorporating visuals more than words more than more than verbal language and underestimating the power of having you know one of these signs on the wall that set, uh, you know these charts and things but that has like you know like don't hit your friends I mean we were in the doctor's office the other day and they have one of the visuals of kid a kid playing on the chair a kid sitting on the chair properly and a kid like what or and not unattend no unattended babies and she just out of the blue on her own volition started to tell me what our rules for the room was and that we weren't supposed to be leaving any babies on the table. I'm like, fresh out of babies, I think we'll be cool. Good job. You know, it was just like, so Bonnie, I'm, if I could go back to that age, I would put more signs up, not, not in a chaotic way, but I would put more useful signs. I had them up by the toilet and by brushing teeth and all of that. So, and this works into my, what I'm saying, my, my game plan. So I just kind of wanted like a, yeah, you're in the right direction or no, but um, mine is just is entering the room. Uh, mine is just too we have to work on regulation first. So, um, okay, <laughs> we're in the bathroom together, y'all. <laughs> um, um, oh, and we're still recording, it's fun. Uh, okay, so she can't understand, like I can't, I could have a conversation with her if all of the other, like the grid, right? Like if those things weren't overwhelming her, right? If she's just, cause we have this, you know, like this cluster of things, instant overwhelm, mm -hmm. have to deal with the overwhelm. And that's what I'm hitting like every time, everything. Everything is zero to 90 overwhelm. And then this is all we're doing. Just hostage negotiation, you know, top down or, you know, talking her off the ledge. That's it, that's our life. So my game plan is adjusting myself most of all right right now that's my first 
first thing always is actually. Uh, but I have a lot of ways to go and I need tips. Feel free to email me or Facebook message me or whatever in the group. I need tips on how to get that playful mood that you talked about because it is not my nature I am not I was not meant for any kind of like elementary pediatric where like naturally mm -mm. I'm mm -hmm. so serious I'd rather talk about like I don't know research uh and so when I am just like hours into a hostage situation and I'm so over it and I know and Nicole is just like the kid whisperer on this. I don't know how she does it. She just pulls this like out of some extra resources somewhere. And she's all of a sudden like, okay, let's play this game. And blah, blah, blah. and I'm over there yeah. like, <sighs> I'm like angry, grumpy cat in the corner. Like, yes, that's so great. <laughs> so you are, you are not alone in the challenges with transitioning to that state. I will say that. And um, it's wonderful to have role models. Like my partner is very much, sounds like Nicole, like, like playful is his thing. Um, but it's, it's, we can't beat ourselves up for not being that person. And so there are real reasons why we have challenges with the things we have challenges with. We did not come into parenthood as blank slates. We all have our histories, intergenerational. I mean, it gets quite complicated. We're going to talk about that next week because I like, let's all like, hold on to what Hillary has said in terms of, I'm going to start with myself. <laughs> if you haven't picked up on it, like, this is why I only work with parents. I'm like, it, gosh, it really relies on us, right? Our kids are who they are. They are who they are. And it can be super, super challenging. And also there's so much that we can do, but we have to do it, right? It's made easier with a community of people to support us, but we have to begin. So we're gonna talk all about ourselves next week, okay? Cause that's the missing piece here. I mean, we've kind of led to it a little here and there, but we have to talk for three hours about ourselves to, or to have that piece solidly in place too. Cause it's such a big part of the equation. So I have enjoyed my time so much with all of you again. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend and we will um, meet again next, next weekend, okay? Great, take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye.